Sorry, forgot to start the the YouTube live. Rates per year. He tangled you from a distance. He tangled you from a distance. I told you he was the professional. <laughs> All right, um, it's, we're going to get there. I'll, I'll show you in a second. Let me just see what the other questions are. Because depending on what the questions are, then I'll see how I take this, this class, okay? Hey, Tidy, it's okay to say that I did the same to you, because I think you did this chapter before. <laughs> Don't feel bad about talking bad about me as well. It's okay. So Leah wants to explain a amortization table. So I think it's along the same line as Tidy. That's why I was waiting for the question. Okay. And Daphne, you need to get a text to speech uh, or speech to text type of thing because you're still typing. All right, so I'll do this. Daphne, as you're, as you're typing, I'm going to address uh, the amortization table. All right, and then we'll get into this chapter. Okay, guys? So we're going to go to page 196. So Tidy, was he here? Tidy? Yep, all right, great. So I, I kind of knew that this was going to come up. All right, so first of all, this chart, I have this actually uh, something about this in the, um, in the YouTube channel. I have a video dedicated to, to this portion. Um, did you guys see what just popped in as a question? Yeah, it's like the whole book. Thank you, Daphne. <laughs> all right, so I'll read it in about half an hour, okay? Let's go over this real quick. Um, so I, I have a video regarding this specifically. Um, I see you're talking about uh, asking about arms adjustable rate mortgages as well, Daphne. In the YouTube channel that, that I created, so you have the link on the student portal, I have a video specifically to adjustable uh, rate arms and specific to this. There's another video. I'll go over it briefly. Uh, I'll try to do the best I can. I also don't want to... Uh, do a 20 minute on each point and then cut too much into the class but I do have even with my class I tell you guys if there's something didn't get it go watch that video which is specific to these uh, sections okay so as far as this right here this this chart the first thing you guys need to remember is that this chart is going to be provided to you that's the first thing you got to remember so you don't have to remember the numbers that are laid out here you just have to know how to use it well it's very easy how to use this chart okay so that's the second part that you need to remember right here to the left it tells you how to use it. the third thing you, t you need to remember before I, I head on to explain is this whatever number you find in this chart whatever number you find in this chart will lead you to the sorry it will lead you to the monthly payment monthly not yearly it will lead you to the monthly payments per thousand dollars of borrowed money okay so for every thousand dollars loaned or lent to you right the number that's here in this case let's say if it's three percent ten years the number you need to use is this one all right you don't have to know how to calculate it this is the number you need to figure out how much you're gonna pay you guys got it so to figure out a thousand dollars how much is it going to cost you a month a thousand dollars to pay in 10 years at a rate of three percent a thousand dollars you would have to go by this number okay because it's per thousands all right so let's figure this out let's say and i'll give you a quick example in a little bit let's say in this and what it says here right is the rate is eight percent for 30 years right so we need to figure out what is the number that represents the payment 
over 30 years on a loan of 8%. So we're going to go at the first column all the way to where it says 8. So we identified the 8%. Then we're going to go all the way to the right, follow it in a straight row, to the column that says 30 years. And the number we get to is 7.34. All right? So this is what you did. 8%, 30 years. And that's the number we identify. Okay? 7.34. Why 7.34? Complex calculations. You don't need to know. I just said that before. But this is the number that's needed to amortize or to kill the loan over 30 years. All right? So we go going to go back here. Right? And the number we identified was 7.34. Correct? So if we're borrowing a hundred thousand dollars and they say this chart is per every thousand then you have to divide a hundred thousand you have to divide it by one thousand then what, what number do we have there are one hundred thousands in this loan so that means that this number right here is going to be multiplied by the number of thousands we found how many did we find 100 times the 7.34, which is the number needed to amortize or to kill off the loan. How much is the monthly payment? 734. What you need to remember is that this is monthly. Principal and interest only, because that's what PI means. Principal and interest only. All right? So pretty much this is all you have to do. So we're going to do a quick uh, exercise. You guys ready? Anybody has questions now or can I go for the exercise? You good? All right. So right here. We're going to jump up and down. That's the exercise we're going to do. All right. Jump up and down. Jumping jacks. And then we're going to figure out that we're borrowing. <laughs> we're borrowing 300. Sorry. And make it a little bit more complex. 375,000. That's the money borrowed. It's not the purchase price, it's the borrowed money. Big difference. You might have a question that tells you purchase price and then gives you the down payment, right? How much is the monthly payment? So this is the borrowed money. Geraldine, what you're doing? I see your hand like, you want me to stop? Am I going too fast or are you telling somebody else to shut up? <laughs> somebody else, okay. All right, guys, kick everybody out of whatever you are, well, except for Tidy and Yamili. Kick whoever's next to you out of their room. Simple. Is Nicole here? There she is. Did you kick your mom out of the room or you found the room for yourself? Okay, good. All right. Heather just kicked Chad into a different house, so we're good. <laughs> she says yes. <laughs> All right, back to this. So $375,000 loan right? The interest rate, I'm going to tell you that it's going to be six and a quarter is the interest rate. I don't want anybody to give me answers, okay? So do not give the answer until I ask for it. Is that a deal? Okay. So six and a quarter is the interest. And I'm going to say it's for 25 years. This is the term. So get familiar with, with these things, right? So when they say 25 years, it's the term of the loan. And the question is, how much is the monthly PI, principal and interest? All right, guys, go. Use the chart. I'm going to give you, write this down. I'm going to give you the chart back in a second, okay? But if you have it in front of you, take advantage. So $375,000 is what we borrowed at six and a quarter for 25 years. Write that down on a piece of paper before I switch to the chart. 375, six and a quarter, 25 years. Ready? I said do not give me the answer, Geraldine. I don't want anybody confusing anybody. So just write down your answer and we're good with that. See what happens when you have distractions at home? 
All right, let's go back to once I asked. I didn't ask the answer yet. Let's go back here. This is the chart, so I'm going to take these arrows out of here. Okay. I don't know if you guys can see or not, but... Uh, right there. Can everybody see what's here? If you guys cannot see it, I'll zoom, but give it a try. It says, first column says rate, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, and then 30 years. It's $375,000 at six and a quarter for 25 years. How much is the monthly principal and interest? Do not give me the answer until I ask for the answer. I understand how I got you confused when I said how much is the monthly, got it. Mm -hmm. All right, if anybody's watching from the YouTube Live, you're also welcome to ask questions and I'll address them. Just so you guys know, I had two people pass the state exam this Saturday. One of them was a student of mine. The other one was somebody that was just watching YouTube live and referred a student to me. And she said, thank you so much. You helped me pass. So, and just referred a student. That's awesome. So it's always good that I can help other people, students and non-students. So she was a, this person was a student at another school, but a little confused, so came to uh, to my channel and been watching since. Thanks, Vanessa. All right. <clears throat> So since nobody complained about Zooming, that means everybody can see. So I hope you got your answer locked down. I'm not gonna ask for the answers, guys. I'm gonna explain to you what you need to do and hopefully matches your answer, okay? So the first thing you needed to do, I said it's six and a quarter. So I made it easy for you because I wrote it down like this. So you go to the first column, six and a quarter. But it could have been written 625, 650, 675. They will not do any other variation. It will be always in quarters, okay? So um, that means that once you go to the state exam, the chart is also represented in this way, okay? So it's very easy for the state exam to follow this uh, chart. So six and a quarter or 6.25%, whatever way shows in the exam, they mean the same. And then you have to go all the way to the right till you get to the column that is the 25 years. That's this one. Correct? Did everybody get to this one? 6.6? .6. Give me a thumbs up. Let me see. Great. All right. So that's all you had to do is come to the right, to the 25-year mark, right, which is the one before last, if you guys see it here. All right, so 25 years. And it's 6.60. .6 so let's go back here. The first thing we did was this, always. Always figure out this number, then everything else comes along, right? So 6.60. So before you ask why this number, I just said before, just because you don't need to know. This is the number. It's the same question that you'll ask the doctor. Well, doctor, why it's five milliliters of this instead of 10, right? Nobody asks that. It's just there. That's the, the recommended dosage. Deal with it. Does that make sense? Here, this calculation, why we get to this calculation, somebody already did the calculation of what number divided by the 25 years, what number will amortize a six and a quarter loan? Got it? 
So you don't have to figure out that math. You just have to figure out how to get to that number from these two numbers. All right, so the next thing we're going to see is that we have to divide by thousands because this number, guys, is per thousand dollars. And every time you see per means division. If you see percent means divided by 100 or percentage, that's what it is, same thing. So if it says per thousand, you have to divide by thousands. So where do we divide by thousands? Right here. You're going to divide this by 1,000, and that equals 375. So now we got two numbers. We have the number that it takes to amortize, and we know how many thousands we have in the loan. Okay? All right, so here we go. Ready? Three, seven, five is the number of thousands times the 6.60 .6 or 6.6 .6 that it takes to amortize a 25 year loan at 6%. And the number that we get, calculators, now you can help me if you got here. 375 times 6.60. 2,475. So yes, Geraldine, you're correct. And this is PI per month, okay? So monthly PI. And there you go. That's the whole thing. So we'll call this step number one, step number two, step number three. That'll be it, okay? Step number one, go to the table, figure out what that number is. Step number two, figure out how many thousands you have in the loan. Step number three, multiply the two numbers you just found, and that's your monthly principal and interest. Any questions? You got it? All right. Can I confuse you guys now? Say yes. Heather's like, no, I got a headache. Stop. <laughs> All right. Oh, Vanessa's asking a question. So I'll bring this down while I wait. You're welcome. <laughs> That's it. So Vanessa, then it would be the same thing, it's just that here we'd have 0.5. Same thing. All right? That's, that's the same thing. All right, next. Since you guys got to this and that was the only question. Now let's say, the question is the same, 375, uh, six and a quarter, and 25 years. But properties in this area all right, that's what the question will be like, for instance. Properties in this area have, let me go here, taxes per year. These are the real estate taxes, yearly real estate taxes. But they also have 1,200. I make these numbers easy so it's easier to understand. In the insurance. So now my question is, how much is P I T I? So this is principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. So we already know that monthly P I is 2,475. My question now, do not answer, please. Do your math. Do not answer, okay? Um, my question is gonna be: if this is your monthly P I, how much is your monthly P I T I? Principal interest, taxes, and insurance, okay? Things to remember for state exam is that this says yearly, per year. If this number is monthly, what do you have to do? Very simple, divide by 12, okay? And now you have $1,000 a month, right? And you have $100 a month. 
all you have to do, you're going to add them up in this brand new bill for your mortgage. Okay. You guys got it? <laughs> Take pity on you. Sure. <laughs> All right. So, guys, obviously the question is not going to have round numbers as I'm giving you right here. But it's very easy to understand that the biggest mistake you guys make usually is this. You don't see yearly and you start calculating like ridiculous stuff. Pay attention to yearly. Pay attention to monthly. The number in the chart is always, always monthly. That's what it says here. That's why I highlighted it. If you guys noticed in the book, it's the only two things I have highlighted right on top, which is monthly payments per thousands. All right? So I'll go back here just to leave it up for you guys. All right? Any other question on this? Tidy's yelling at you, Millie. Listen, that's why study groups are not the best thing. Linda has an extra student and running away. Okay, got it. Let me do a roll call. David, where are you? Come on. Come back. I see Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Rudy's there. Who else? Chad, while you guys are going over, over this stuff. Nicole, Joseph. Tidy Peter. Linda's cooking for us. We go back to Linda because I see her in the kitchen. So make sure it's good, okay? Because we all want to eat. Uh, Yanessa, I see you. Sarah, you're so far away. What are you doing? You're watching a novella or something? Some soap opera? Uh, Jane, I see you. Steven, I see you. Okay, Riley, Brian. Uh, who else? Meredith, I see you. I see Abanu, Catherine, Geraldine, Talia, Heather, Gil, Natalie. I don't know where Sabrina is gone, but okay. Moses, I see you. Luz, Vanessa, Lena, Perla, Crystal. All right, and Anthony. All right. I hope I called everybody because this, for some reason, just moves people around as I'm going through. <laughs> Kick them out, Heather. Kick them out. That's it. Simple. All right. Um, Carlos, I saw you before. This jumped. Hold on. Oh, I see you right there. Sorry, I'm telling you, this. I was doing, doing roll call and then everything shifted. I'm like it's like a it's like a game playing tricks on me. All right. Um, so Perla, you're saying your rate is 2.25. If your rate is 2.25, do not touch it. Write it for 30 years. Don't touch it. You won't, e you won't even be able to refinance. You don't get lower than that right now. All right. Anyway. All right, so you guys understood how to calculate this? Yep. All right, cool. So here's the thing. If you guys got this, then you, you will understand that, uh, I mean, nowadays it's a lot easier. We have a tool. The only thing that ever came out good from, uh, from Zillow is this tool. It's called a mortgage calculator. It's an app you can put on your phone. It's the only thing you can use Zillow for, nothing else, okay? So it's, it has a payment calculator, which is very accurate. So you enter all this information, you don't have to calculate anything, it does the calculations for you, all right? Luz, are you okay over there? Okay, so uh, why is this important right here? I don't need to send you to be pre-approved yet, right? Let's say this is a single family. This purchase that, that your client's about to make is a single family, right? 
I have a simple question. Mr. or Mrs. Potential Buyer, what is your budget? Monthly budget. Because I don't care how much you want to buy a house for. I want to know how much you, want, you can afford to pay a month. If your budget is below this number, then obviously something here has to change. Either we're moving to a different area where taxes are lower, or you're buying a different type of house where uh, the, the purchase is lower, or it's a multifamily which will help you purchase, uh, pay the, the loan. Does that make sense? So before even going anywhere, I have to have a clear understanding of what my client needs. Simple. You guys got it? These are simple calculations. Just put in the numbers into the calculator, uh, Zillow Mortgage Calculator, and that's it. It tells you, hey, you're going to pay roughly this amount. Do you think this is something you can afford every month on a single family? All right. And if somebody says yes, then comes my second question, which converts uh, 9 out of 10 uh, buyers. Second question is, if you lose your job or if your significant other loses his, his or her job, would you be able to afford this by yourself? Uh, no. Most of the times the answer is no. So maybe we should look into a multifamily. I know you don't want to have tenants, but it's just for like a year. You'll be able to get out of it right after. Uh, depending on life situations, you could switch even before. But traditionally, a year you have to stay there. right? But at least you have somebody that can help you pay for the, for the mortgage in case one of you loses your job. Right? Just in case. You never know what could happen, especially with the way things are going. Right? And worst case scenario, worst case scenario, in a year from now you move and you get two tenants that pay your mortgage on a single family. Does that make sense? So now you can move on to your single family and you got somebody paying a mortgage and part of it is going to help on your, um, on your single family mortgage as well. So this is the way how I get them to convert from buying single families to buying multifamilies. Okay? And also you can afford way more house with a multifamily and for the same monthly payment. All right, guys. Cool. So uh, let's go. I told her half an hour. I think it's been half an hour. So Daphne, let me address your question. Let's see. All right. So here you go. The question is, um, and sorry, uh, Talia, I will explain points in a second as well because I think it comes here. Yep, right here. All right, so who issues a third party instrument? Uh, does the borrower have to sign it? Estoppel certificate? So that's a lot of questions all in one, okay? That's why she never stopped typing. So <laughs> uh, why does the borrower execute this and not the lender? Uh, so that's for chapter 13. Chapter 14, for a balloon payment, you still have to pay the last payment or does the term of the loan completely change when refi occurs? How often do people use the point system? Is it better on long-term loans that are fixed? And can you do points on arms? Whew, that was a lot. Uh, <laughs> so I can do this, the uh, <laughs> Jim Carrey version uh, of this which is without breeding, never ending, just spill a bunch of stuff, or I can go slow, all right? Which one do you prefer? Taking my time or just going at it? Taking my time, okay. All right, cool. So first of all, what is an estoppel certificate? Because to address, to address this, uh, sorry, the, to address this, we have to talk about the estoppel certificate first. What is an estoppel certificate? As the name says, it stops, right? Uh, it's not tested in the exam. You should know about it. It's not tested in the state exam, but what is a estoppel certificate? It stops uh, the action from the uh, bank. So when it switches from one bank to another, right, you are supposed to technically, by law, to issue a, cert a sto estoppel certificate, you the borrower. Does this happen nowadays? No, they just transfer, they send you a notice. If you don't dispute the notice within 30 days, that's your estoppel certificate, you agree to it. Nobody signs. Simple as that. But they tell you, hey, uh, by the way, there's going to be a new holder of your mortgage. I'm transferring, I'm Bank of America, I'm transferring to Chase. 
new holder of the mortgage. This is the balance on your mortgage. Do you agree to it? If yes, please reply. If no, please reply. Or just don't say anything. Then we'll approve it the way it is. And it's written there. That's what it is. If you dispute these amounts at the time of transfer, right, then now's the time to say something. That's the estoppel certificate. Good? That's all it is. Why does the borrower have to issue it? Because a mortgage and a promissory note are a two-party instrument, lender and the borrower, right? So imagine I give you a check, right? And you go to, uh, to Bank of America to deposit that check, but you don't sign it. Is that check valid? Same thing. When you gave it to me, it was a check. If it was not signed, then I, can I transfer? No. I have to endorse it. I have to agree to the terms of that check. It's the very same system. All parties must sign. So in this case, who issued it? Who issued the check? The borrower. Okay? Where's Daphne? Right there. You got it? Good. Next. Uh, next question was, I already address why. I address what it is. Great. For Chapter 14, balloon payment. So first of all, what is a balloon payment? A balloon is something that's inflated, right? So a balloon payment is a bigger payment at the end. So why would people do this? As Ricardo was explaining it, it's not used as, as often as before. Um, some banks don't issue it at all. But in a balloon mortgage, you're making lesser payments, monthly payments, lesser amounts, right? But then at the end, you have a bigger inflated amount. So your last payment is a big payment. It could be based on a five-year loan, right? I'm sorry, it could be a five-year loan based on 30-year amortization. That means payments are based on 30 years, but at the end of five years, you pay off the balance of the loan. It could be even a 30-year loan, right, based on 30 years, right, but with a larger payment at the end. So they only amortized a portion of the loan. So let's say you borrowed 300000 but they're amortizing on, on uh, 200000 that means at the end, you have a $100,000 bill to pay. But your monthly payments were lower than what it would be for the $300,000. Good so far? Great. So you're asking if the, the last payments would change at refi. Absolutely, because at the time of refi, you're paying the balance. So what changes? If you're refining with, at the term, let's say the five years, then no, there's no change. Five-year mark was the due date that's when you refi does not change. If you have a 10 year mark, but you refi in five years, of course it changes. It's the principal balance. So at refi is always the principal balance. It might not be the last determined payment, right? Because you can refi tomorrow. You get into a loan today, you refi tomorrow, as an, as an example. So obviously uh, the last payment or final payments will change according to when you're refining. Good? Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go into points right now. And question number two was, uh, I mean, the final question was, can you do points on arms? And the answer is you can do points on any type of loan because it's an agreement with the lender. Okay? It's an agreement with the lender to do what? To reduce even further the interest rate. So if today the interest rate is 5%, let's say, and the bank says, hey, congratulations on getting approved on a 5%, for two points right now, for two points, right, we'll drop to four and a half. Instead of paying 5% for 30 years, you're going to pay four and a half percent for 30 years. So you're paying two or three points up front, but to save in the long run. So is this used still? Absolutely. Is it used a lot? No, a lot of people don't, want, don't have the money or they think they're not saving anything. And then comes question number two to this, which is, should you do it? It depends on the savings. If you're going to save 10 bucks, the answer is no. If you're going to save 20, 30, 40, 50,000, then yeah, you're paying two or three thousand dollars up front as an example to save 30. I think it's a great deal. Why did I say 10 bucks saving? Because if you're going to stay there for a short period of time, then paying points doesn't make sense. If you're going to stay there for five years, why would you prepay? You see what I'm saying? You're going to stay for five years. You're going to get rid of the house right away. So why would you prepay? It doesn't make sense. All right? 
So before I go back to points, I just want to see. Heather, holy moly was for uh, the dog or holy moly was for explaining slowly? Which one? <laughs> and I think it's more holly molly, but we'll go for it. <laughs> Oh, to how long the question was, so I was wrong in both, okay. All right, so the other thing about points. Um, the thing you guys need, need to remember, take a note of this somewhere. You need to remember, it was great questions. I knew, I knew somebody had them, but she couldn't log in before. <laughs> um, here's something you guys need to take a note about points. Very, very important, and 90% of you will forget. So to write this as many times as you can. All right, go like Bart Simpson and just like it a write it a thousand times, okay? Point equals 1% of loan amount, not the purchase price. Point equals 1% of loan amount, not the purchase price. Underline, double underline, triple underline, put stars, arrows, bubbles, whatever you have to do on the not the purchase price. Because a lot of you are going to calculate 1% or 2% of the purchase. No. Percentage of loan. One point equals 1% of loan amount, not the purchase price. Okay. That's most likely a math question, just saying. But there might have to be a question that says, what is a point? Okay. But it's not the purchase price ever. How do you calculate? Listen, you were able to give me principal and interest in two seconds, but you don't know how to calculate 1% of a loan? <laughs> All right, so, oh, you're typing. Okay, let's see what she says. You guys understand that nowadays typing is essential, right, for a job? Learn how to do 100 words per minute. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, okay? So, uh, I mean, after, after Daphne's question, like, everything's game right now. Like, it was like a thousand questions in one, so. All right, it says, uh, would we subtract it from the monthly payments or overall the whole thing? So. Overall already says the whole thing, so I'll go with overall. Okay, so it's one percent of the loan. So let's say we're buying for three hundred thousand, right? Actually, let me make a simple. One hundred thousand dollars is what you're, uh, uh, what we'll buy. Okay, one hundred thousand dollars. But then there's uh, ten percent down payment. How much is left? All right. If there's a hundred thousand, there's ten percent down payment. Then the loan amount is ninety thousand dollars. Correct. The one percent comes from the ninety thousand dollars not from the purchase which is a hundred that's what I was saying so if they're asking you up front for one point right now you're talking about nine hundred dollars on top of your down payment so ten thousand dollar down payment plus nine hundred in points boom that's your your uh, cash at closing That was like 10 years ago. Requirements now, okay? 10 years ago, I went for, for a job interview. Not 10 years ago. 14 years ago, I went for a job interview at the Continental, right? Because I wanted to do the part-time thing and then have the, the traveling thing, you know, being able to fly everywhere. Um, anyway, so one of the requirements was actually uh, this. Right, I did like 82 or 83 words per minute, but now not anymore. They want more. They they want this type of 
words per minute. So you know what you do now? Speak <laughs> to text. That's it. That's the fastest thing. Or if you want to be even faster, you, you guys want a trick? Quick trick? Okay. Google is a liar? Oh, probably. Uh, anyway, so another quick trick is actually Google. They have uh, an option to dictate uh, whatever you, you're... Uh, so you put one app that's reading the text, and then you put another app that's typing the text that one app is reading. So I just gave you a quick idea on how to make money on the side. You go to a website where they require you to type stuff, right? And then you go to another website where it types everything for you. And you make two, three hundred dollars a day just doing that extra stuff. All right, anyway. Ha, try asking questions. Oh, did, did I say that? Sorry, it was a, a loud thought. I'm sorry. Um, go here. All right, if there's no questions, guys, let's go into chapter 15. It's 6.30 now. Chapter 15, you guys ready? Give me a thumbs up if you're ready for this. Great. So, uh, we have financing two. Uh, financing one was FHA, uh, VAs, conventionals, right? Um, now, chapter two is talking about what happens in primary and what happens in secondary markets. So, my first question to you guys is, drop it in the chat. What are the primary colors? What are the primary colors? Primary colors. Hmm. Not bad. It's like the first class that's been kind of on point with it. Okay. Let's ask Google. <laughs> All right. Um, go on, Chad. So primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. And why do I ask about the primary colors? Simple. Because primary colors originate everything else, correct? They're called primary because once you start mixing them, we get secondary colors. You guys got it? So when I talk about primary, primary markets, what you need to remember, this is where loans originate. Or where loans are created. Primary markets where loans originate, where they are created. Okay? And Daphne, I saw your question. I'll go back to it in a second, okay? All right, so after a loan is created, then it goes to the secondary market. Not all of them, we're going to talk about this later or possibly tomorrow, not all of them go into the secondary market, but they could go. So you guys remember we just talked earlier about a stop certificate, and this happens, for instance, when a lender is selling the loan to another lender, all right? So that means that a lender originated the loan in the primary market and is now selling the loan in the secondary market. Secondary market is where loans are bought and sold, okay? So secondary market, loans are bought and sold. We're going to go over all this in this chapter, so we're going to repeat this stuff. But I want you to associate automatically. Primary markets, they originate, just like primary colors. Secondary market, something happens to them after they've been originated, right? So they're bought and sold. You're going to find the same thing if anybody has ever done securities. Uh, if anybody's ever invested in stock market, there's a primary and there's a secondary market, right? Same thing. One is where it's originated, and then it goes to the purchase and sale of those originated um, markets, for instance, okay? Give me a thumbs up if you got it so far. Great.
which uh, Great Depression. I think we're still depressed. All right, so before we get into this, let me uh, address uh, Daphne's question. <laughs> Where's Daphne? Right there. Um, so I mentioned before, why would somebody uh, do the points? It's an exchange. So if your interest for five years, for five years, you, I'm sorry, for 30 years, your interest is 5%, would you prefer to pay 5% or pay 45 for 30 years? Which one would you prefer to pay? I think it's a no-brainer, right? You always prefer to pay the lesser uh, interest, okay? So I, I said that. It does all the time. They offered it. They offer it to you. So that's why you would pay the points, is to be able to drop from 5% interest rate to 45 for instance. That's why you do it as an exchange between the true interest and the lower or below market interest rate. So it costs you a little bit more up front, but you're gaining in the long run. Happens all the time, okay? All right, back to Gil. So after the Great Rep Depression, <laughs> Repression. after the Great Depression, um, isn't the guys from Wall Street that started covering uh, the loans? Uh, let's put it this way. So after 1913, we stopped being America and we started being a bankrupt country. But we cannot talk about this in this class because it will take forever to explain that portion um, when we talk about Federal Reserve and uh, all the exchange, the social security number we use now, which is a promise that there's still gold in this country and there's enough money to back, there's enough gold to back the money they're pumping into the, into the streets. So because this is not a finance class, I'm going to skip it for now. Is that okay, Gil? <laughs> But yes, to answer shortly, the, the answer is yes. <laughs> All right. Um, that'll be a, like, if, if you guys are confused with some stuff now, wait until we get into this chapter. And if I start addressing what I just said, forget it. You guys will never pass this exam because you'll get stuck on the amount of fraud that exists on the American people. Anyway, uh, next, financing techniques. So this is pretty much straightforward, very easy to understand. If you see the word purchase money mortgage, right? Pay attention. If you see the word purchase money mortgage, then it refers to buying a property. It's the mortgage or the financing that you got at the time of purchase. Simple. Every time you see purchase money mortgage, the word purchase money mortgage, somebody financed the purchase money. You did not have enough money to purchase, so you got to purchase money mortgage. All right. After you purchase, you already own the property. This is now is called refinancing. If you ever take money or restructure your current loan, anything after the purchase, it's called refinancing. Why? Because you're either taking further financing against the property, right? or you're restructuring your current financing. Either way, it's refinancing. Okay? It's almost like refried beans. They've been fried already. You're just refrying them. <laughs> Same thing. Some people will get that one. <laughs> All right, next. That was easy, right? Next, we got reverse mortgage. Now, this one's a little confusing. What is a reverse mortgage? As the name says, it reverts back to you. So instead of you making payments to the bank, the bank makes payments to the borrower. That's why it's called a reverse. You're not paying the bank. The bank's paying you. Right? Who wants this type of loan? Raise your hand. Let me see. No, you don't. No, you don't. It'll be nice. So, Gil, yes and no. It's a very bad deal for the people that don't understand what is a reverse mortgage. So, let's look at this. It says it's based on the equity. What is equity? Well, equity is the difference between current market value and balance of the loan. So, the equity you build up over time 
like as you pay the loan and as the property increases in value, that this is this difference is called equity. So what you're doing is you're giving that equity to the bank. You're saying, I'm not touching it. Bank, you can borrow my equity to strengthen your financing. So they can borrow money, right? They can borrow, the bank can borrow more money with your property. So instead of you doing it, they're doing it, okay? The problem is, this is a great deal. It's a great deal for whoever needs it. And who would need it? Well, senior citizens on fixed incomes, okay? So reverse mortgage is only available for senior citizens, first. Second, you have to be on the fixed income, meaning you're struggling, your social security is not enough. So instead of selling the house, they're telling you, look, don't sell the house, you've built enough equity, right? And we'll pay you instead of you paying us. Now taxes and insurance is still on you, but at least you're not paying the, the mortgage uh, loan. You guys got it? Good so far? All right, here's what happens. Okay, I'll address Heather in a second. But here's what happens. The loan accumulates interest and is eventually paid, right? Usually from the sale of the property or when the owner moves out or dies. So just like Heather was saying, it goes back to the bank. Now the bank doesn't want it, so there's a sale, all right? The key thing here to understand is that either way, you are moving out, either at sale, moving out, or uh, dying. But either way, you're not staying there. So obviously if you're dead, you're not staying. We got this. But what about your heirs? Can they continue? The answer is no. A reverse mortgage ends when that person who requested the reverse mortgage dies so why is it a great thing because if you're on the fixed income you don't have to worry about paying your mortgage somebody's paying it for you sometimes it kind of just like balances it out so it's zero sometimes you actually get cash back from the from that sale so it might go towards taxes insurance whatever but either way if you plan on leaving this to your children or your heirs the answer is no, not with a reverse mortgage, okay? Good thing we don't get involved as realtors, but it's a great thing to know and advise our clients because over the years, even though they already purchased, they still come back to you for advice, okay? So being the person, the counselor, the greater news of this, being the counselor, is that you get referrals, all right? So make sure you guys are knowledgeable about these things. Let's see the questions. So Heather says, and the money they give you on the reverse mortgage is not the true amount of the equity. It's only about 60 to 70% of the actual value of your property. Not only that, it's minus the balance of the loan. Don't forget that. So here's the thing, guys. The younger you are, the harder it is to get. You have to have a lot of equity. The older you are, lesser amount of equity necessary. What does that mean? because they're giving money to you while you're alive, what if you live another 30 or 40 years, right? The promise is that they'll pay you while you're alive. So just like an insurance company, they bank on you either, if it's a term, not dying. So that's why they give you those cheap policies for a certain period of time. Like, hey, 30 years is all you expect to live, right? It's kind of like, you know you're gonna outlive the policy Right? And they know it too, that most likely, based on law of large numbers, you will outlive the policy. So they made money and you got nothing. Right? This type of loan is the same thing. So they don't give you the full equity and you have to have a lot of equity in order to get into it. Okay? Uh, Joseph, why wouldn't they just refinance if they need the money? The home? See, when you refi, you're cashing out money, but now your monthly payment is also higher. So, Joseph, do you think that makes sense? If you're already struggling to pay, right, why would you take another loan and then pay a higher amount every, every month? That's crazy. You got it? Next question. Um, what happens to the money that the borrower is in paying? 
it, you're you're still paying on, on the the first mortgage. Okay, Let, let's look at this. You're still paying on the first mortgage. The thing is, they're giving you a reverse mortgage. They're paying you to pay that first mortgage. So there you go. All right. So they're paying you to pay the first mortgage. So it's not like you're not paying anything. They're using your equity to make thousands and thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? If not millions of dollars to help you pay your hundred thousand dollar debts. That's what happens. It's like kind of like an exchange. Okay. And then uh, trading a car. Yeah. Okay. You got that. Heather says my mom got a reverse mortgage because she was on a fixed income. Yeah. Sucks. Um, you have to pay back the equity borrowed. So I just mentioned that it kind of offsets itself. All right. So back to this. And there's also reverse purchases. So if you're buying a house that has enough equity of whoever's selling it to you, right? If there's enough equity, you can buy the house with a reverse mortgage right away. But again, make sure your clients understand reverse mortgages doesn't go to your heirs. Okay. The next one is home equity loans. It's a form of second mortgage. Okay. That means when you have equity, just like the reverse mortgage, when you have equity, you can borrow more money against the property. Okay. So homeowners whose property has appreciated in value, they may borrow up to new loan to value ratios, borrowing against, against it as they choose. Um, I'm sorry, that, or a more popular version, line of credit. Okay, so line of credit or home equity loans. Let me tell you about home equity loans. I do this in every class. Very, very simple. Home equity loans. What does that spell? I know I'm missing a letter, but hell, right? Why? Because as I said before to, to Joseph, right? If you take another loan, it's already difficult to pay your first one and you're getting a second one at a higher interest rate usually, right? Because a secondary mortgage, as you guys know from, from chapter five and on, I'm sorry, from chapter six and on, uh, uh, a second mortgage in terms of foreclosure will most likely always lose. So they charge a higher interest rate to recover money as quickly as possible. Okay. So imagine you have a mortgage at 6% and then you get hell, a second mortgage at 9%. That's what you have to think. Hell. What I like is HELOC. HELOC is a home equity line of credit. So just like in the business, if you have a business, you shouldn't get loans, you should get lines of credit. Why? Because they act similar to credit cards. What is the benefit of a credit card versus getting cash in your hand? What's the benefit of a credit card? Well, you use the amount of money you need, right? You have a certain limit, you use the amount of money you need, let's say 10,000 out of 100,000, you use 10,000, and you pay back on interest on the 10,000. If you have hell, then you're going to pay interest on the 100,000 because you borrowed the 100,000. You see the difference? Here's another good thing about it. A HELOC, just like a credit card, you paid back 10,000, right? Guess what you can do right after? You can borrow more. You see what I'm saying? Just like a credit card. So you can keep on borrowing against your line of credit as you need so if you have equity guys you can double triple quadruple the amount of equity you have by making investments and that's what investors do they buy the property cash for instance and then they refi either to a, a heloc or hell depending on what the needs are right but they refi at 75 percent let's say they cash out how much money they put in they rinse and repeat and they buy more properties, cash out, rinse and repeat. Buy more properties, cash out, buy more properties, cash out. How do you multiply your wealth in a couple of years? That's it. That's the trick. 
Can you use the line of credit to go go uh, Gary V style? If you guys don't know who Gary Vaynerchuk is, you should. But Gary V style, can you go and and go to uh, garage sales and buy a thousand dollars worth of stuff that weekend and flip it for eight thousand dollars? Sure, you can. Right, because you buy you can buy a, a a box full of stuff for like five bucks. People don't want it anymore. You go on eBay, go Amazon, go Walmart, and I mean Walmart, uh, eBay or Amazon, and you find those uh, items there whatever they're, they're worth and sell them you got a whole box for five bucks but you make two three hundred dollars in that box so can you use a line of credit and double it and triple it that way sure can you invest in real estate sure if you know about cars can you use that money to buy a car right at auction and sell it to somebody else right after sure i mean the good thing about a home equity line of credit is that you can use it for whatever you want just got to be wise with your money but it's an opportunity to use the equity buildup or the payments you've been making and paying yourself. That's what it is. You guys got it? Thumbs up? Good. I just made you guys rich. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, next. Let me see, is Pedro on the line? All right, Pedro, the line. Uh, Pedro, let me know if you're listening to this because I think we should up the charge on these classes. We're mixing with investments, so we should up the charge. All right, so I'm just telling him to make a note that we're gonna charge thousand dollars from here on. <laughs> All right, next. Um, let's say you're trying to. See this will this happen often? Uh, this scenario. Uh, yes and no. Most people need to sell their house before they can buy another one, so yes. If you don't need to sell your house in order to buy another one, then no. But there's a way to do this. There's a way to sell your house and buy another one at the same time. Okay? The ideal scenario is that both closings happen within the same week. That would be ideal, right? But sometimes, as you guys know, there are delays in closing, right? So let's say there's a delay. You still did not sell yours, but you really need to close on this one. What do you do? You get what's called a swing loan or interim financing or bridge. What is a bridge? It connects two points. So in this case, connects the sale of your house with the purchase of your other house. It's a temporary loan, no more than six months and usually with higher interest rates and interest only as well, but allows you to close on a property you're buying while you're waiting to sell the property you're selling. You guys got it? This is a in-between bridge, um, interim, swing loan, whatever you want to call it. They all mean the same. It helps you move forward while you're waiting for something. We're going to skip shared equity. We're going to go into package mortgage. So it all already says what it is. It's a package deal, right? So let's say you get into a house and it's staged, like usually we see in condos, it's staged. You look at it and say, hey, this is a great house and the way it's staged, it's perfect. I don't even want my old furniture. So now you're gonna go to the mortgage person and say, hey, listen, we like the house, we're pre approved for the house. Is there any way we can get a little, more, a little bit more money to purchase the house as is, like furniture and everything, furniture, appliances, all that, right? If they say yes, then they give you enough money for the purchase of the house and all fixtures and everything else that's there. So now it's called a package deal. You're buying the house and the fixtures. You guys got it? All right. So before we move forward, package, house and fixtures. So I want you to write in the chat real quick. If there's fixtures and appliances, and then there's a house, which documents do we use for each one? Which documents do we use for the house, and which documents do we use for fixtures and appliances? Gil, you gotta put the whole thing. I asked two questions. Which document for the property, which document for um, the personal property? appliances, fixtures, and stuff.
Come on, 95 words per minute. <laughs> Bill, I got, so Gil, I got two. Okay, so Bill Sale indeed got it. So you're right, but just give me a little bit more. What is the Bill of Sale for and what is the deed for? I was going to say that, but I didn't want to say it like that. <laughs> Just mess here. Don't worry, this whole weekend I've been like at two words per minute thinking. It's been really bad. All right. Gil, I don't need the expensive words like conveyance. But yes, so bill of sale is a conveyance or transfer of the fixtures and appliances. So what's considered personal property? All right, Joseph wrote the same thing. And deeds for the home. Perfect. So, guys, because it's a package deal, there's going to be two documents for transfer or, as Gil said, conveyance. Okay? Two documents. There's the deed for uh, the house for the real property. Remember these terms? There's a deed for the real property. And then there's the bill of sale or receipt as we know it, but for state exam, bill of sale. Right? For the personal property, appliances and some fixtures. Okay? You got it? Good. You know I'm always going back and forth, so gotta get you guys ready for it. Next. All right, the next thing we got is, and you know how I know everybody's confused about what I just asked? Because only two people answered. <laughs> Plus Heather thinking, processing. <laughs> but two people answered. So everybody was confused about the question. And, it, and it's normal, it's okay. All right. Um, the next thing we got is blanket mortgage. Now this is different from package mortgage, even though it covers more than one item, just like the package mortgage. A blanket mortgage is mainly for parcels or lots. So parcels or lots. So it's mainly for subdivisions. So blanket associate to subdivisions right away. So let me talk about this real quick. I bought this large piece of land, right? For me to purchase it, I had to get a mortgage, right? I don't have that much money, so I had to get a mortgage. I had enough for the down payment. I have enough for the subdivision, but not enough to purchase and subdivide, so I get a loan. Or maybe I have all the money, but I still want to get a loan. It's called leveraging. We'll talk about that in a different chapter. So I got a mortgage. Now. When I cut this into pieces, because I'm subdividing, right? When I cut this into pieces, I intend to sell the lots, right? The question now is, can I sell all the lots at the same time? Do you think it will happen where I sell the lots at the same time? The answer is most likely not, okay? So, yep, Chad just wrote exactly what I was expecting. So most likely not. So. I'm going to sell a lot one by one. So let's say I sell this one to John, Adam, Mary, and so on. So these lots are being sold individually to different people. Do you guys remember yesterday? Well, um, Friday, I'm sorry. So in the previous chapter, you guys talked about, in actually chapter 13, you talked about alienation clause. And then when I came in from the break, chapter 14, you asked me and I addressed it again, alienation clause. What is alienation clause? It's due on sale clause. That means the entire debt, the entire loan is due at the time of sale. So if I borrowed money to purchase the land, Make sure you guys are paying attention because these chapters are a little complicated. So if I borrowed money to purchase the land, I got a mortgage to purchase the land, right? 
and then I'm selling it to John, like let's say the first sale is John. If I sold it to John, then there was a sale, period. The mortgage usually says that it's due at the time of sale. So imagine, oh, sorry. Imagine that I sold this it no longer belongs to me, it belongs to John. The due on sale clause would force me to pay off the mortgage. Correct? You guys with me? Okay. Due on sale, due on sale means the bill is due at the time of sale. Right? Okay. So it's like, hey, you had your meal. Thank you. Before you leave, pay the bill. You're not leaving without paying the bill, right? You ate, great, hope you enjoyed it, now pay. That's what it is. So you sold it, you enjoyed it, now pay. Now, do you think this is fair to a subdivider that the first sale, they have to pay off the whole balance of the loan? Do you think it's fair? All right, Chad just said no. What do you guys think, everybody else? No, it's not fair at all. So this type of loan for subdivisions is called blanket mortgage so a blanket mortgage covers the whole thing blanket mortgage covers the whole thing and it's a loan specifically for subdivisions as i pointed out over here right it says blanket subdivision so associate automatically and it allows it's the only loan that allows a partial release clause partial release clause so that means that every time you sell a parcel of land you're slowly releasing the grip if you guys remember mortgage the word mortgage you're slowly releasing the grip that the prop that the bank has on your property in this case you sold it to john right so the bank is releasing the grip on this parcel of land. You still have four. The bank's loan still covers the rest of the four. You're still good. Okay? You sold to Adam. They'll release the grip on Adam's lot. Okay? John and Adam, done. They're no longer your properties. But the bank releases the grip on these and still keeps a grip or the pledge of these three ones. You guys understand? Instead of asking for the whole thing, they allow you to slowly pay the loan at the time of sale. Okay, instead of paying the whole balance, you slowly pay the loan every time you sell. That's why traditionally the profit, the profit that a, um, that a subdivider or a developer will have will happen somewhere here in the last lot because the first lots most of the sale price will pay off a portion of the loan okay it's the only loan it's the blanket mortgage the only loan that has a partial release clause the other loans they all have a due on sale or at the time of sale clause okay questions drop it in the chat if you got questions No questions, no questions, no questions. All right, I don't see question marks, so we're gonna go forward. All right. Linda's awesome. She went from the kitchen to now doing the laundry. That's great. Joe's just running around, all right. I'm telling you guys, if you don't pay attention to these chapters, 13, 14, 15, and 16, it's going to be tough. It's going to be really tough. Make sure you eliminate all distractions this week. Please try to eliminate as much as you can because it will be tough. Um, Moses, partial release clause, it's only for blanket mortgages. So traditionally blanket mortgages are for subdivisions so yes so associate the three 
partial release, subdivisions, blank of mortgage. Okay? Wrap around mortgage. So what is a wrap around mortgage? Sorry, I'm just doing my check here. I see Flavio. No background today, Flavio? Good. At least I know you're there. <laughs> and kind of paying attention. Got it. <clears throat> Abanu, I can't see you. I see a background. I don't see you. Let's do a roll call again. Sabrina, I see your eyebrows and up, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> she gets so comfortable over there. Um, what else? David, it's always a battle with a few of you, you know? It's always a, a battle trying to get you in the camera. Sabrina, I know you're there. You just lean back. You get comfortable. I got it. I got it. Let's see. Mina Fozzi, I see you. Joseph, you're back. You just run, run around once in a while. Meredith is still here. Great. Let me go over this. I feel like I'm telling my, my little kids, pay attention, pay attention. All right? Except adults. You know, I think it's probably harder to teach adults than it is to teach children. Children is easy, very easy. At least back in the day it was. I remember when I was in school, something always got thrown at one of us. Like the teacher would always throw something at us. It's easy, pay attention. Now you cannot even touch the kids, it's, it's crazy. Right? Imagine, I always got chalk uh, thrown at me or the, you know, the board uh, erasers, I don't even know how you call it in English, but to wipe the board. Something always came my way. Not towards me, but the person behind me. I always dodged. <laughs> Yardstick. There you go. Slammed on the desk. The ruler. Absolutely. I got hit. So, Daphne, I got hit with the ruler several times because I'm a lefty. And when you go to Catholic school, at least back then, uh, when you went to Catholic school, it was a thing of the devil. So, you get smacked so you can write with your hand. So, I learned how to write with both. I just went back to, uh, <laughs> to the left hand. But it's funny. Uh, Moses, yep. Simple stuff. All right. Kids, make sure you get to the camera. Come on. You're trying to give opportunity for everybody to pay attention. Sabrina, don't worry. I know you're there. I was just messing with you. I just see people just running around. All right. So my warnings have been given. So if you have to, to come back to class or if anything happens after this, uh, my hands are washed. I've done my job. OK? All right, cool. So uh, you can call me. <laughs> I was going to say something. Forget it. Um, wraparound mortgage. What is a wraparound mortgage? So it's a type of seller financing. So what is seller financing? Is where the seller becomes the bank. They're the ones that lend money to you or extend credit to you. So when they're seller financing, the, the seller doesn't give you money, right, per se, just like the bank doesn't give you, right? What they'll do is say, hey, no problem. Pay me over a certain amount of time with interest, and then I'll give, the, give you the property, or I'll give you the property now, and you still pay me, and I'll put a lien on the property, all right? So I'll get to that a little bit later. So wraparound is a type of seller financing. What happens here is, so pay attention. What happens here is very simple. You go to the bank, and the bank says, no, reject it. All right? You guys are going to learn, uh, most likely tomorrow, uh, you guys are going to learn that the banks reject you not just because of your credit score. But they reject you because of the amount of the loan sometimes. They reject you because of the type of loan sometimes. They reject you because of the type of house sometimes. They have certain limits, and the reason why they reject anything beyond those limits is because they intend to sell it in the secondary market. As we said earlier, there's primary and secondary, right? So your bank says no to you. You go to the seller and say, look, I really, really like your house. 
I love your house. I have the down payment. I have a great job. Here's the proof, right? So I have the money. My taxes are great. My credit, eh, I had a little issue a couple of months ago or a couple of years ago, whatever. Things happen. Life happens, right? Okay. My credit was perfect and then just dropped. And then it went back up and then just dropped. You know, some things happen in your life where, you know, credit is used. So the bank doesn't care about that. What happened in your life? I, I don't care. You don't know how to handle your finances. That's period. That's the answer. So the seller says, well, you got down payment. You got good credit. I mean, you got good, good income. So why not? I will allow you to purchase my home now, but instead of you paying the bank, you pay me. Okay. Now, because you're not paying me in full and I still, I'm the seller, you're not paying me in full and I still have, I also have a video on this, by the way, on the YouTube channel, uh, because you're not paying me in full and I still have to pay my bank, right? Let's say I have Bank of America and I become your bank, so Bank of Bruno to you, right? You pay me and I pay Bank of America. You got it? So you're not paying me in full, so I cannot pay the bank in full. You guys got it so far? So your mortgage wraps around my mortgage with the bank. You pay me, I pay them. You pay me, I pay them. And this is how it goes until you've paid me enough that I say, based on, on contract, I say, look, you've paid me enough, here's the deed, or you've paid me in full, here's the deed. So it's whatever we agree to. You guys got it? So you, you're buying the house for 400000 I have a balance of 100000 You gave me 20%, so that's 80000 If I chose to pay the bank directly, then I'm left with $20,000 mortgage. If I chose to leverage that money into buying another house, then I still have a $100,000 mortgage. You're paying me on four hundred, dollars which is the purchase, right? And I'm paying them uh, on the balance. So again, you pay me, I pay them. You guys good so far? Okay. So what Moses wrote is that the seller becomes the bank and charges a higher interest rate, of course, because of the risk involved, which also leads to this. The buyer should require a protective clause because if you pay me and I don't pay the bank, how can you secure the, the interest that you have on the property? So the protective clause says that if I don't pay Bank of America, then you, the buyer, can go around me and talk to Bank of America directly. You guys got it? So it's a protection for you to be able to bypass me if I don't pay the bank. Okay? These arrangements are complicated arrangements. And anything that becomes complicated requires attorneys. Okay? It's not a, sim a simple one for family transaction that we prepare. We don't prepare these contracts. Anything that's creative, which we call creative financing, anything that's creative involves protections for both sides. So attorneys prepare those. We cannot give any type of legal advice. Um, Daphne's asking, who lives on the property? Is it like a sublease? No, it's financing. And you can live on a property, Daphne. I took your down payment and I went and bought another property maybe. Right? Maybe it was a property I don't live in already. We don't know. But you get to live in the property, pay for it. But you only get the deed at a later time. So you only get title to the property at a later time. So it's not a sublease because lease is renting. This is financing. Okay? Yanessa. Does the bank get notified that there's a wraparound mortgage? Well, you guys remember subject to and assumption of a mortgage? Okay, that was the, the end of chapter 13. See, at this point you're buying subject to. If we tell the Bank of America, think about it. We tell Bank of America, hey, there's a new person here. If we tell Bank of America, what is Bank of America gonna say? Well, the loan is due at the time of sale. So if there's a new person there on title, then you need to pay me off. Unless we do what's called an installment sales contract. This was chapter 11, the very last thing on chapter 11, contracts. 
and the installment sales contract is called contract for deed. What does that mean? You only get the deed, just, just like a car financing, you only get the deed at the end. So at this point, Yanessa, could we tell the bank right now that there's somebody moving in? Yeah, they're moving in, but they are not the owners yet. Does that make sense? They have a beneficial interest, but they're not the owners yet. All right? Good? Great. Talia, you look like you want to ask a question. Uh, Daphne, no, because rent to own, rent to own is renting. This is financing. It's a similar concept as far as you're getting it only at the end, right? It's a similar concept. The difference is rent to own, there's a lease. You're renting. Financing, you guys remember the end of chapter 11, I said similar to car lease, and I said similar to car financing. In both of these, you only get the title at a later time, okay? In one, you're renting. That means no interest is attached to it. You're renting, it's a lease. In the other, you're financing. So there's an interest attached to every payment that you make. It's principal and interest. Here you have a landlord. Here, the, the owner, the seller becomes the bank. That's the difference between them, okay? Uh, so Heather says in rent to own there's a lease and part of your money goes towards the future purchase of the home so Heather yes and no some some states do not require that part of that money goes towards the purchase state of New Jersey requires that part of your lease to own part of the lease payment does go to the uh, purchase not all states require okay so I just want to point it out not all states require that you should accounts towards the, the purchase, but not all states require. Talia is asking, how does the seller decide about the interest rate? Look at me, Talia. How do we decide? Simple. Let's see how the wind blows. All right, 10%. I'm the seller. If you guys remember, uh, uh, you guys talked about usury, right? Illegal rate of interest, high charges, no? Okay, so you can charge, actually we're probably gonna talk about it today. Uh, you can charge whatever you want as long as it's not usury, as long as it's not above certain limits mandated by the state. State of New Jersey, if it's a, a property you're financing, you can go up to 16%. If it's the property where you live, you can go up to 30%. So it's whatever I feel like, up to those limits. How do we determine whatever we feel like up to those limits? Moses says, bad deal for the buyer, good for the seller if the banks are giving loans at 2.25%. If you got Perla type of loans, yep, yeah, it's a really bad deal for the buyer. But look, I really want to buy. And after I'm in it, think about it. After I'm in the property, can I now refi and cash you out? The key sometimes is to get into the property. That's the key. Once you're there, you might be able to do whatever you want if there's enough equity, okay? And now your credit might not weigh as much because it's a refi and it goes against the property. So there has to be a balance to it, okay? Uh, Talia's asking, isn't better that the buyer Try to get his own mortgage on the house. That's what I said, uh, Talia. If the bank says no to you, if the bank says no to you, then you're trying to get the seller to say yes. Obviously, if you can get it directly from the, the bank, it's way cheaper than private lending, okay? Obviously, from the bank, it will always be way cheaper because they have government sponsoring most of the times, okay? FHA loan, for instance, yep. Absolutely, or even conventional loans, because the bank always has some type of government in uh, incentives, right? Uh, they're they're backed by FDIC. They're, they have so many insurances on it. A private lender does not. 
if I lend money to you and you don't pay me, I'm screwed. The only insurance I have is the house that I allow you to buy from me. I'll foreclose on you. You got it? So yeah, it will be better to go to the bank. But what if the bank says no because of a blemish on your credit, which tomorrow will go up, but you really don't want to lose the deal. That's the house you want. You see what I'm saying? So now you make a deal directly with the, with the seller. You could be, it could either be, like we said before, a rent to own, like Daphne was saying, right? Where you tell the, the, the seller, hey, listen, um, I really want to buy, but I need at least three months to fix my credit. Could we put a lease for the next three months or six months or a year? And within the year, I will purchase the house. That will be a rent with option to buy. Or could you be the lender in this case? I'll give you down payment. I'll pay you in installments. And as soon as we're good, I'll refinance and cash you out. So it's going to go to the same uh, outcome. It's just that in one, the bank makes, the seller makes more money than in the other. That's the only thing. For the buyer, it sucks. But if that's the house you really want and banks are not approving loans, then creative financing. Uh, what else? How can, Daphne's asking, how can you refi if the seller is the bank? Refinances, refinances are based on value of the property. It has nothing to do with whoever the lender is. So you're going to refi, you're going to go now to Bank of America, Daphne, and say, hey, Bank of America, I own this property. There's a mortgage that I'm paying to the previous seller, so they're the bank. Does the house appraise for the refi? If yes, then the refinance is where you get a new loan to pay off the previous loan. Refinancing. A refinancing could be there's equity and I'm getting more money from the house. But in this scenario, refinances to pay off the old loan, which was with the lender, so uh, with the seller, so now they're cashed out. Uh, Perla, how often does this actually happen? When the market is tight, when the banks are not lending, that's when it happens. So a couple months ago, everybody got scared because the banks stopped lending. Their 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 criteria for low uh, credit scores, their criteria for two or three Ks, which are construction loans, all that got so tight as they were figuring out what to do, that people were already starting to look into these types of scenarios, right? Then banks came back and said, hey, we figure out a way to do it because the government is sponsoring, so let's go. We can still give you the loans. So now there's money on the streets again, so they can lend. So when does it happen? When things are tight, when banks are not lending. So they said it's not meant to be. Maybe it is. If you know, listen to this. If you know, let's say you're 2005 Jersey City. Anybody remembers 2005 Jersey City? No. <laughs> Heather's like, no, I know Texas City. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so if you guys remember 2005 Jersey City, for instance, things were starting to skyrocket. They were still very low, the prices, but starting already to skyrocket because they were hearing about something called Barclays Center about to happen. So as the properties were getting demolished, there was still no value. But right after Barclays Center and everything started getting built around, right, properties started going up and people started getting out. So now Jersey City, Jersey City was at, um, and then came also the deregulation of the rent control in New York. So. What are you trying to say, Perlin? Was that a direct hit for us? Did you guys read what Jesus wrote? Should we know? 2005, I was still in high school. Anyway, so for those that know what happened. <laughs> anyway, so this is what happened. You could buy, up to 2005, you could buy a 2-3 family for less than $300,000. Good luck trying to buy it now for less than 300000 Actually, for less than 600000 Wait, for less than 900000 Wait, for less than a million dollars. So there are certain areas of, of Jersey City and still 
even the, the poorer areas of Jersey City, the value just went sky high, right? There are certain areas of Jersey City that right now you do not buy for less than a million. And it's Jersey City, it's not New York, okay? So let's say, going back to Talia, it's just not meant to be. If you know you're in the market that's about to skyrocket, the, the values are going to go up over the next two or three years, wouldn't you make an effort to buy a $300,000 house, even though the bank said no to you, knowing that that house is going to be double or triple in the next three years? You see where these types of deals come into play? Banks are saying no, but this is a really good deal. Let's hit it. Let's take it. Okay, make a deal with the seller. I showed uh, one of my uh, students uh, in March, right before this whole quarantine thing. I showed her how to do that on the property here in, the, here in Newark. Just the rent that she's collecting, and she got the seller <laughs> to finance the, the whole purchase. Simple. And because she's the realtor on it, once the, the, the sale is over, right, she also can use the commission as a down payment to the seller. So seller, I don't want anything out of this. I'll help you sell. So she's the listing agent and the buying agent, right? Because she's the one buying. She used her whole commission as a down payment to the seller. Simple as that. And now the seller is the bank. A year from now, from all the, the rentals, now she's going to have a year of rentals. Go back to the bank, right? And any bank will finance that purchase. Boom. Everybody wins. It's a great deal. Nicole just got kicked out. Okay. Uh, contract. Okay. So yes, uh, and like I said right here, and I'm sorry I'm taking so long on this, but it's important, especially the market that's about to come. Um, we will talk about that another time. But um, this is very important because you guys are going to have uh, opportunity to sometimes deal with sellers that are losing their homes, but they cannot. They don't have the credit now to go buy somewhere else, right? So you might be able to buy their house. They go rent somewhere else. You buy their house, right? They finance the purchase, the wraparound, for instance, right? They charge you high interest. Meanwhile, they're paying their, their lender without the uh, further defaults. We're back at 2006, 2007, guys. Actually, we're, we're going way faster to 2008, but different story. All right, you guys got the wraparound mortgage. We're good. Okay. Next, we have open end mortgage. Open end mortgage. It's a HELOC or credit card because a credit card is also an open end loan. The fact that it says open end means never ends unless the creditor says hey, you're not using it. You probably heard this before. You're not using it, so we're closing it, right? They don't have to. They're not obligated to advance additional funds. So a credit card and a HELOC operate in the same way. It open-ended, meaning you can borrow money, pay it down, borrow money, pay it down, borrow money, pay it down. Keep on going. A closed-end mortgage is like hell, home equity loan, or the purchase of your house, the, the first financing of the house, a closed end loan means that the loan must reach an end and you cannot borrow anymore. Open end, you can keep on tapping into the loan or the line of credit. Good? Great. All right, so, sorry guys, I was just reading here. Comment. All right, uh, next. I gotta start checking your guys uh, before class, gotta start checking your guys' temperature and a bunch of other stuff. Like every other day I have somebody that I'm not feeling well, I'm sick, I'm this, I'm that. Some people make it through, 
like they fight like Heather, right? Still here, right? Others just give up. Anyway. I'm just kidding, okay? Like I said, life happens. <clears throat> so, oh, Yamili has a question, okay. I didn't answer your question? Oh, okay, oh, I'm sorry. So at that point, you can change the name of the buyers. Um, lost. At what point? Sorry. Could you um, explain again what the question is? Like, reformulate it? Let me go here. So you're talking about in the seller finance, can you... Um, you're, you're saying that if I can change the name of the buyers now, then that would be a sale. If you change the name of buyers, there's a sale. You cannot change the name of buyers in a refi or with a wraparound, wraparound mortgage. You have to understand, every time there's a change in the deed, right, it's a sale. Whether it's $1 from two entity to one or from one to two, right, or from two to two, or to a corporation, or whatever, that's considered a sale, okay? Refinance is not a sale, it's just changing the current loan, okay? So if there's a change of buyers, then it's called assumption of a mortgage. It's different than refinancing. You got it? So can you change the name of the buyers, or the owners in this case, at refi? No. It'll be a different sale, different owners, different mortgage, different everything. You can always change the names of the people on title, but if it's while a mortgage is in effect, then it's a change of uh, title, so therefore a sale. And it's based on the provisions of the mortgage document, if you can or not. Okay? Um, Daphne is asking... Close end is similar to hell. It's similar to hell and any other loan. The only open end is HELOC. All the other loans are closed end loans. That means they must they must reach an end and you cannot borrow anymore. Open end mortgage is a credit card. You can keep on borrowing against it as many times as you want. You pay it down, borrow, pay it down, borrow. Okay, that's what it is. All right, let's go, construction loan. So construction loans, just like the name says, it's for construction. It's very simple. The thing you guys need to know about construction, right, or construction loans, is that they don't give you the full amount of money. They disperse proceeds, the loan proceeds, while the building's being constructed. That means you're getting paid as things are accomplished. You finished the foundation, bank says, okay, Here's money for the foundation. You finished uh, the siding, so you, I'm sorry, the siding. So you, you did the, uh, the structure, right? And the, um, I just lost the terms. Anyway, so you finished, you, you, you put up the building, right, the skeleton only, right? And they give you money for completing that portion. Now you're going through uh, covering everything. So you do the siding, you do the roof, you do all that stuff. They give you money towards that, that you accomplished. Okay, so they give you money as you go, but it's actually as you complete an item, they reimburse money. So it's kind of like you're using that as your down payment. You put work, that's your down payment, so that's sweat equity. I see that you did some work, here's some money back. I see you did some more work, here's some more money back. So they give you an installment. Prior to each payment, the lender usually inspects the work because they want to make sure that they're not giving you money and you're gonna run away. You wanna make sure work has been done. These types of loans usually have a higher interest rate and they're short term. Meaning, you have to have what's called an exit clause or take out financing. Like, are you selling or are you getting a permanent loan after this, a 30 year loan? Some lenders tell you, hey, construction for the first year and then we'll convert it to a 30 year loan after that. All right? Some lenders will, but not many. The 
the majority of them, they're giving you a loan for construction, pay me back in a year, and get a loan somewhere else. You're not coming back here. Okay? Our purpose for this loan is the construction, period. You guys got it? Uh, Yanessa, yes. Yamili, I had a construction loan. It's a headache. Eh. It is and it's not. Once you get used to it, it's not. You get used to a construction loan, it's the same thing as private lending. Um, they will uh, disperse money in trenches. The idea is that you're not going to run away with their money. That's all. And also, another thing I didn't mention, but uh, let me show you here. Right here. And also, they want to make sure you're not using just any body from the streets. I mean, you're using a recognized contractor that puts up their license and their bond and their insurance. Because if something goes wrong, the bank wants to make sure that it's covered, right? And a lot of people, what they do is, I got my people, right? My cousin can do the job. My other cousin can do the job. My brother can help, right? Neighbor next door can help, right? We can do this. We can build a house. The question to the bank is, are they contractors, right? Do they know what they're, not the contractors know what they're doing, but that's a different story. Um, but are they recognized contractors? Do they have a bond that in case the house catches on fire, in case there's a theft while they're, they're building, right? In case any hazard happens, they'll still be able to restore the property to original condition, that we're not throwing the money away. So that's maybe the only headache about, uh, the biggest headache about um, construction loans is that you have to have recognized builders to do the work, okay? So Yanes is asking, uh, what's the difference between two or three K and this? None, K is for construction. You got right there, don't you see? K is for construction, right there. I told you guys I was not very good at spelling, so that's what it is. Two or three K is an FHA loan for construction purposes, for improvements or build outs, okay? But there's a conventional construction loan. There's also a VA construction loan. So construction loan simply means that it's towards improvements. All uh, types of loans could have uh, construction. So conventional FHA, VA loans, um, um, the farmer home loans as well, all of them could come with some type of um, construction uh, type of structure. Okay? All right, next. We have sale and lease back arrangements. As the name says, very simple. I sell, I'm the seller, but then I become the tenant. I lease from you. I sell to you, but I lease back from you. I sell, but I become your tenant. You're the buyer, you become my landlord. That's what it says, sale, lease back. Again, it's a private arrangement between the seller and uh, the buyer. Okay, so sale, lease, back, okay? Why would somebody do this? Before you ask the question, let's read. Seller, la uh, sale, lease, back arrangements are sometimes used as means of financing large commercial or industrial plants, okay? The land and building used uh, by the seller for business purposes are sold to an investor such as an insurance company, as an example. Now, the real estate is then leased back by the buyer to the seller, so sale lease back, right, who continues to conduct business on a property as a tenant. So again, industrial, let's say I'm manufacturing, right? So think about it this way. I have old machines and I need to stay in business. If I don't upgrade my machines, I'm gonna lose my business. Which one is worth the most? the building or my business. If it's the business, then I'm gonna sell the building so I can have enough money, working capital, so I can improve my, uh, right here, so I can improve my machines, so I can make, do more marketing, so I can get better employees or be able to pay more to my employees. So I get rid of the building in order to get this done. Coffee time, love it. I was about to give him a break for this. So now, guys, no more break because of Mario. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You too. You leaving?
That's early, man. I gotta get a rental and a bread of money. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, my, Mario's fired. They fired you, Mario. Um, so, again, we need to consider why would we do this? Is it the business or is it the, um, the building that's, that's more important? So people that are about to retire, get rid of the business, right? Rent it to somebody else and we'll just collect from the building. People that are still in the... <laughs> that was a good one, Gil. Uh, so uh, people are, that are still in business that, and they plan on being in business for a long time, right? They sell the building and receive the money to invest. So here's what happens. I get the working capital as a, as a seller, I get the working capital, but you as a buyer, you have a long-term tenant. What's the best thing in real estate? Long-term relationships with your tenants. That means you keep on getting paid over and over, and because you, now you know your tenant, you guys have a, a, some type of, not only the relationship, but you have some type of respect for each other. Over time, you're gonna take care of my property, right? It's my property. You've been here for 10 years, most likely you're taking care of it. So that's the benefit from this. Sale, lease back, I sell to you, but I become your tenant. You take the advantage of having a tenant built into the property or, or into your purchase for several years, okay? Next page, oh, Gil, you have a question? Okay. If you're asking about the break, it's about to happen. Don't worry. I will give you a break. <laughs> Daphne, too. All right. While you guys are typing, let me see my cameras. Flavio is somewhere there. Meredith is there. Okay, we lost a few people along the way. Right. Not bad. Okay. Brian, I charge more for cats, okay? Cats are like five dollars extra. I've seen babies, they're like a hundred dollars extra, just letting you know. All right. And then adults, it's three times. Okay, um, so Gil's question, uh, hold on, okay, Gil's question here, uh, it's not the same as a sandwich lease, so that's subleasing, uh, no, not the same, because there's a sale, subleasing that means I'm the tenant, right? and I lease it to you. So I'm subleasing to you, I'm a tenant. In this case, I'm selling the property. So there's a sale. You are now, Gil, you're the new owner, so I address Daphne as well. You are the new owner, but instead of you um, going out there and finding a tenant now for the property that you just bought, I'm telling you, hey, listen, Gil, here's the deal. I'm gonna sell to you, you're gonna buy it, but I would like to stay here. I mean, all my machines are here, all my business is here, I've been here for years, right? I just needed the money to improve. Is it okay if I become your tenant? So that's the condition of the sale. I sell to you because I need money from the sale of the building, I need the money, right? But I'm asking you, can I please stay here? That's all it is. So you guys understand? Daphne, where's Daphne? I just lost her on the screen. Where is, right there, did you get it? Question. All right. So Chad says that's not a bad deal for the business that can go that can no longer afford right there, uh, or pay the rising taxes, repairs, or whatever. We're stuck. We need money. The building has equity. The building has value, right? That's it. Uh, let me rephrase that, Gil. It's a cash out, like a cash out refi, but I don't keep the building because I cashed out, right? So I don't become the owner uh, either, okay? 
Uh, Daphne, yeah. Uh, I have, what do you mean it would be the same? Imagine moving your whole operation, Daphne. All your operations. So let's say you're a manufacturer, plastic manufacturer, okay? Imagine you sell the building. Let me look at Daphne. Okay. Right there. So imagine selling the, it's not the same. Listen to me. So imagine I need money. I don't have money for new plastic molding machines, okay? So they're expensive, plastic molding machines. Uh, I don't have money for the rising taxes like uh, Chad wrote over here. I don't have money for the repairs in the building, for instance. I only have enough money for the cost of operation to, to keep the lights on. That's it. But I've been paying this building for over 20 years. So there's enough equity, meaning there's like two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 worth of value in the property if I sell it. Okay? The question is, does it make sense for me to grab all my machinery and move to a new location and pay rent somewhere else? Or would it make sense to make a deal and stay right here where I'm at and save a bunch of money by not having to move, right? And potentially destroy some of the machines on the way. You got it? So it's, it's not the same thing because I'm renting. I'm the owner right now of the building. I get to sell it and make money, but I get to stay where I'm at instead of moving somewhere else. And I might not find another building that has the same layout that this one has. This building is perfect for what I'm doing. Does that make sense? So it's not the same at all. I'm cashing out on the equity. I don't have the cash and the equity. I'm taking the equity out. So, okay, hold on. All right, so I bought this for uh, one million dollars, this building, as, as an example. I bought it for a million dollars, purchase. Now, 20 years later, I owe, let's say, I owe 600,000. This is the balance, uh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Fine. You guys, okay, I got it, I got it, I got it, I switched, okay. <laughs> Never seen people participate so much just to call my attention. Anyway, where was I? Uh, so, <laughs> the balance. <laughs> so, like I said, 20 years later, you still have like $600,000 in balance, right? But, <laughs> but guys, uh, real quick, is this the equity, the million dollars versus uh, 600,000. Is this the equity? No, because from the time of purchase, hopefully, this went up in value to 1.5 million, let's say. Okay, this is value. The equity is the difference between these two. So in this case, equity is how much? 900,000, which is almost as much, almost as much as what I paid for the building. You guys got it so far? So over 20 years, it increased in value. I paid down the balance and I still have my million that I put in. I have it almost back in equity, okay? Now, Daphne, I need the money. I need the money to improve my machines Okay, so instead of refinancing and cashing out from the refinance, where I'll have a bigger monthly payment to make, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna sell the building for 1.5 million, okay? I'm going to get 900,000 back from the sale, it's called profit. The equity now becomes profit in this case, right? Only in this case, okay? I'll explain profits better in a different chapter. But let's say I profited 900,000 at the time of sale, right? This profit goes into uh, machines, marketing, right? And I'll reserve some for the rent for the next uh, 20 years, let's say. So now after doing this, if you guys are paying attention, 
after doing this, what just happened? I'm living almost rent free. I'm living. I'm. I'm. Uh, I have a building where I have my operations almost rent free. You guys got it? Because if I built in 20 years of this money, I built it into, let's say, towards uh, uh, the rental, then I can improve my machines. I can pay better the, the employees because I don't have a mortgage to pay or I don't have a rent to pay because it's paid out of the proceeds of the sale. So now I freed up myself, the, the capital that I have, I freed it up to other investments and the business can keep on going. You got it? Yes, no, maybe. All right. Uh, so, Gil, you won't find it much in residential. Uh, could happen. It could happen, absolutely. Uh, for instance, in short sales, that, that happens. Um, I've done a few like that where uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm buying from the person that's losing their home, as an example, in the short sale. So this is uh, creative as well. And I'll tell them, look, I don't want to take your home. It's your home. I'll let you stay here as a tenant if you want. Maybe with an opportunity to buy from me later on. This is your home. It was a good deal. I bought it. Great. Stay as a tenant. Why not? Does that make sense? So could it happen in residential, something like that, sale lease back? It could. You just got to be careful not to make it illegal. Okay? Because the, the seller is supposed to be... Uh, out of there in a short sale and in a foreclosure. They're supposed to be out of there. So as long as it's not an arrangement where you're helping fraud against the banks, then in residentials, could it happen? Yep. Okay. Why would a buyer rent their place? Rental income? Right? That's it. Rental income. I don't. I never intended to put a um, to be a manufacturer. I just saw a good deal. And I went. I purchased, and the company that's there stays. Same thing. Uh, in residential, it's all traditionally. It's a. It's a gross lease. Yes, uh, Gil. Traditionally, gross lease. All right. All right, so I'm just going to do a summary of seller-buyer arrangements, and then we're going to go for a break, okay, real quick. Actually, hold on. All right, we're good. We're going to go for a break now, and then we'll, we'll come back to this. All right, guys, so it's 7.52, 53 now, uh, 8 o'clock. We'll be back. You've got seven minutes. Run.
All right, everybody back. Let me see. Perla, I don't see you. Moses, I don't see you. Talia, Jane, Carlos, I saw you move the camera right now. Okay, there you are. Sarah, at a distance, but I see you. Steven, there's a light. Stay away from the light. Stay away. Oh, there you are. Okay. Here's uh, Meredith, Flavio, Riley, Natalie, Nicole. Is that ice cream, Nicole? You suck. Uh, next, uh, Joseph, <laughs> Daphne, have a new I see you, Anthony, Mina, Linda's holding a book to show that she's actually studying. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, Peter, I see you. This thing just moves everybody around. Geraldine, I see you. Vanessa, Catherine, Brian is gone with a cat. Gil, I see you. Yanessa. Sabrina. <laughs> All right. If I didn't get you, let me know. Gil, what the heck? <laughs> You're too funny. All right. Wait, Daphne, what are you eating? Is that ice cream as well? I hate you guys right now. Magnum, even worse. Magnum chocolate ice cream. <sighs> 18 Oliver Street. That's all you got to remember. 18 Oliver Street, Newark, New Jersey. We're on the third floor. There's an elevator for you. Come on. See what Gills just said? Look, look, look. Let me show you guys. Right here. Daphne and Nicole. Nicole, you're closer, so... Come on. You, Nicole, you're like, what, 12 minutes away from here? 12, 13 minutes away? Come on. To, oh, since your mom is always bothering you, tell her to come drop off some ice cream. <laughs> this way she won't. 10 minutes? Okay. Oh, at this time, maybe, yeah. Maybe it's 10 minutes. All right. Let's go. Seller buyer arrangements. I left, I gave you guys the break, and I left the, the YouTube Live still on. So if I said some stuff for YouTube Livers, if I said some stuff during the break, I'm sorry. Daphne wrote, my last one, I got you next time. So the next time you're going to buy ice cream is when you pass the exam? Okay. I love these promises. When I make my first sale, I right, Heather? Klondike's. I, I see. I see you putting it there. I'm just ignoring it for a second. Klondike Reese's. Okay. And then you guys want my help, huh? Go ahead and ask me questions after this. Mm -hmm. Daphne, this was the last question you could ask. I'll answer more after you pass the exam. <laughs> what would I, oh, that's well. That's the way you say it. Yeah, I got it. I will not answer this, unfortunately. Uh, we're live. Next, seller or buyer arrangements. So where it says seller and buyer arrangement, guys, we are talking about it before. Creative financing. So you have something called traditional financing, which is you go to the bank and the bank lends to you. That's traditional financing. Creative financing is when you cannot get traditional financing. You make arrangements between the seller and the buyer. So these are private arrangements. Okay? Or I'm going to show you in a little bit with third parties as well. But private arrangements. Now, there's seller financing. We talked about this in a different chapter. Now it's a recap. Where it says takes back, this is just called seller. Uh, I'm sorry. Seller financing is where the seller takes back the mortgage. 
So they take back the house in the form of a mortgage, in the form of a lien. Okay? So take back financing. If you guys understood what happens in mortgages, the mortgagor is the one that gives up the house, right? So the bank now has a grip on the property. The bank is the mortgagee that holds the property. So in this case, if the seller is financing the purchase, then the seller is the bank. So the seller is the mortgagee. The seller is the one with the grip on the property that they just sold to you. Why? Because they're lending money. They are the bank. They have a grip on your property until that loan is paid off. Okay? So they, the seller now holds a mortgage. Okay? Seller holds a mortgage. They're the mortgage holder, just like the bank. Okay? The next one is lease option. We talked about this. Lease option and lease purchases. We talked about this in chapter 11. I told you that this was similar to car lease. <clears throat> so similar to car lease is because they either give you the option or you ask for the obligation, right? So a lease, when you lease a car, they ask you up front, do you intend to buy the car at the end? Or do you want to have the option, if you really like the car, to have the option to buy it later for X amount of dollars, right? So if they give you the option, you rent the car for two years, three years, four years, five years, at the end, you can buy. In this case, is the same as, um, Sarah, stop looking at shoes. Pay attention to the class. Anyway, so um, I just got a, a notice from my partner. He zoomed in to figure out what she's doing on the camera, right? She's buying shoes instead of paying attention. You see that? Some of you go for ice cream. She goes for shoes. I don't know. All right. Anyway, so as I was saying here, there's the lease option where you have the option to buy later or lease purchase where you have an obligation to buy later. That's why I have here in yellow to make that distinction. Okay? Any questions here? Let me know if you have questions. No? All right. Then we have land contract. Land contract, we already said that this is like a uh, land contract is like uh, similar to, <laughs> I can't with you guys, financing. Okay. So why is it similar to car financing? Because you pay with interest over time. You pay the bank. In this case, the bank is a seller. You pay with interest over time, and you only get the deed, right? You only get the deed at half or full purchase. So when you finish paying, just like your car, when you finish paying, you get the deed or the title transferred to you, similar to car financing. Daphne, this was similar to car lease, as I said, because you're renting with option to buy or you're renting with obligation to buy. So that one's an option. This is obligation. This is where you're saying I'm definitely going to buy at the end of three years. This is where I'm saying I'd like to have an option to buy at the end of three years. So similar to car lease. This one similar to car financing because you get the title later. Okay. Sarah's, Sarah's back. She, she didn't hear what I said before. Okay. Heather says she's trying to look for what shoes are you looking at in your screen. Sarah, I know you're typing something, so I'm addressing it right now. You're buying shoes instead of paying attention to class. I know it's your third time. I'm just, we're just messing with you. 
Uh, don't worry, Heather. I have it zoomed in. I will share with the class what shoes she was looking at before. I'm so glad it's shoes that you were buying. <laughs> That's all I got to say. All right, next. Um, <laughs> the next one we have is... Um, I know, Chad. I, I, I bet. So next we have is a sale lease back. We just addressed this is where right before the break. Is where the seller sells but becomes a tenant, where the buyer buys but becomes a landlord of the seller. Okay. Well, congratulations, Sarah. Now is the right time to get into real estate. All right. Hold on, guys. Great news. Right here. Great news. Okay. Take advantage now. That's it. Almost 16 years ago, it was me getting fired. So I lost my job. I got separated and got into a car accident a little bit before that. So it was all in one year and I had to make a decision. So I have uh, the greatest people that, that I've worked with over the past few years. They, they had to have that push. It's where life says, hey, wake up, right? So when things happen like this, it's wake up, something needs to change in your life. That's all it is. If you don't have it already a stability, uh, something that, that like you don't have to work for the rest of your life, that you have that income, right? Then you need to create that income. And your boss is not going to create for you. I'm not telling you guys to quit your jobs. What I'm saying is some people need the push to wake up. I have a lot of people that are licensed and haven't sold anything in, in their entire their entire licensed life. I feel don't even show up for trainings. And not just my company, I'm talking about uh, several agents or uh, students and students and agents. Um, Carlos, you're, you're right there, so you know this. You, you were licensed before, so you know this, right? In every agency, it's the 80-20 realty. Uh, tw I'm sorry, he wrote realty. It's the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of the licensed people will do the work of uh, the 80%, right? So 80% don't do anything. You guys understand? So some people really need that slap in the face, like wake up, do something, treat your part-time as if it was a full-time, and then eventually that will take over um, your full-time job, okay? And you have the freedom. Really, Gil? I open up my own uh, school, my own realty, insurance company, and a bunch of other stuff, yeah. Absolutely. But I'm not, I'm not the broker. My partner is. Well, that's why you came here. That's why you ignored me for three years, Gil. <laughs> Just messing with you. Uh, Carlos says, back then it was more like 90-10. I, I know. I was conservative with my numbers. You know, but I know. Um, it's the same thing here, guys, with, with you guys. Um, the majority of you pay attention. Some of you are like, I got this, I'll study at the end. The majority of you, 90% will, will pass, 10 will still have difficulty. The one that said, I'll study at the end, 90% will fail, 10% of those will pass, right? And some of you will be back in class right after. Some of you will be back in class a year later. Some of you will feel like, Bruno better not see me again, so I'm gonna go to another school, you know? so. This will happen always. This will happen always. I, I'm in, I'll tell you what, in the first year teaching, I was like, what is going on? Where, where am I failing, right? And then as the years go by, I went more like, all right, I know I'm doing my job, all right? I'm teaching, I'm trying to be entertaining, I'm trying to be engaging, right? If they're not getting it, then there's something, like if they're not passing, there's something on their end as well. You're, you know, so this is a compromise. It's I give to you and you guys give, give uh, to me as well. So you need to participate. If I see you walking around or not being part of the, the class at all, like I said before, I wash my hands. Unfortunately, I'm a dummy and I still send you guys messages and I still ask you if you have questions. I still will see if you have any difficulties, right? Because I care about the students and I want to make sure you guys pass, right? <laughs> then you have Daphne, says Daphne. 
I wouldn't expect that from Daphne. Anyway. I love that you ask questions. That that's some, there's always somebody. That's good. Uh, hold on. Let's just uh, the noise go through. I already adjusted the mic so you don't have that much background noise, but Newark's tough. Yep, they're coming for me. But I'm on the third floor, and we locked the door downstairs, and the elevator can't. You, not many people know how to work the elevator, so we're good. Let's see. Uh, Gil says, what I meant, Bruno, is will you explain if we wanted to join your team? And the answer is no. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, some schools, I was going to say the school I was at before, some schools are recruiting. Um, <laughs> hey there, yes. Uh, some schools are recruiting schools, which is illegal. Um, I cannot discuss anything about, I gave that disclosure in the first day. I cannot discuss anything about recruiting until seven days after you've left the course. So I cannot talk about recruiting at all. We are not a recruiting school. If you choose, you should always consult with several different brokers. If you choose to consult with ours, it's not me recruiting, it's because it was your choice to do so. All right? So no, uh, I, cannot, um, I cannot talk about joining the team, at least not during the classes. Later on, could we um, could we talk about uh, the realty? Yeah, it sucks for us as a school because we cannot until seven days after you completed, you got the certificate from the school, <laughs> right? So you pass, you got the certificate. Seven days later, I can start calling you. Uh, if you choose to do it before that, that's on you. It's not me recruiting. And other agencies cannot recruit the students either until they're out of my school. So they can they can recruit prior, but they cannot touch my database. Um, I have something called career night. I just haven't been able to, to do it. Career night. So if I had the career night going on and you show up for career night and you talk to one of the agencies that show up, it's you participating. It's not them recruiting directly. That's what I'm talking about. We cannot recruit directly from um, from the, the, the class, okay? So again, if you show up later, as I have a few people that just were here today and I have some coming this week, if you show up later to interview, that's a different story. Okay, go. At that point, I'll explain about joining, what we have and what we don't have. All right, back to this. So any school, what I was trying to say is any school that tries to recruit you from the school to their agency, that's illegal. Okay. And that puts a lot of pressure on you. You're saying, wow, because that's what happened to you? Or you're saying, mm -hmm, I don't know. Don't even tell me where from. You don't have to. <laughs> I know a few of the schools that do that. All right, I know. So sources of um, real estate financing, primary mortgage market, and we're gonna end with uh, this section, and tomorrow we'll do the secondary market. So source of real estate financing, primary market. We already know this, it's highlighted. We know that loans are originated in the primary market, and then they're sold in the secondary market, okay? We got this already. From, this is right from the beginning, correct? Now, who can originate loans? Well, it could be an ins institutional lenders like uh, savings and loan associations, commercial banks, mutual savings banks, life insurance companies, mortgage banking companies, mortgage brokers, credit unions, pension and trust funds, and finance companies. So there's a lot of uh, companies out there that could, so institutional lenders, that could lend money to you to buy a house. Also, we have individuals, so sellers, investors, employers, brokers, and let's cross this one out, relatives. Uh, occasionally, there are sources for financing. Okay? You don't have to cross it out for state exam, but in real life, they might not be the best sources because you still have to deal with them later. So not the best source of money. Next. 
right on top. Insurance companies amass large sums of uh, money from premiums paid by their policyholders. Insurance companies. Now, a certain portion of this money is held in reserve to satisfy claims and cover operating expenses. But much of it is invested in profit-earning enterprises, such as long-term real estate loans. So here I like to do, um, in every, every single class, I like to do a quick exercise as well. So let's see what's going to happen here. Ready? There's 36 of you. And I would like to see everybody participate in this. So the question that I'm going to ask is very simple. And it's going to be about insurance. Now, guys, pay attention. Do not answer until it matches you. Okay? So don't say no if it doesn't. Right? Just say yes if it does. And don't be embarrassed about the question and about the answer you have to make. But if you had over the past year, one year, if you had an at-fault accident, at-fault, that means you caused the accident, please write in the chat me. One year, at-fault. So, I, so I'm, I'm going to explain this in a second. At-fault, just say me, nothing else. At-fault. One year. Two people? Okay. So two people. Don't don't answer don't answer it if it does not apply to you. We got two people right here. Three people now with Linda. <laughs> How did I figure that one? All right. Um in the past two years, in the past two years, please write me. If you had an at fault, you caused the accident in the past three years, uh, two years. Steven, okay, so we got four people. Anybody else? At fault, you caused it. Flavio, so you got five people. Anybody else? Two years, at fault. Okay, three years. Got five people so far. Three years, at fault, you caused it. Nobody? I mean, if, even if you're typing 20 words per minute, I think you can answer. <laughs> it should be easier. All right, so we have three years. Let's make it four years. In the past four years, how many of you had an at-fault accident? We got five people so far, six people now. Can I get more? Can I get more? Six people so far in the past <laughs> four years. No? All right, final question. Ready? Five years. In the past five years, who had an at-fault accident? That's it? That's it. Five years. Okay, so let's, let's look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, the six people, gotcha, <laughs> good driving record, there you go. So, the six people, guys, the six people that had at-fault accidents in the past five years, can you let me know, please, can you let me know how much was the claim that your insurance company had to pay? How much was the claim that your insurance company had to pay? Let me know, please. You don't know? You don't have an idea? Flavio says $1,000, Brian says uh, $1,400. There were six people, come on. Lena, how much was it? You don't remember? I mean, you gotta, it's, been, it's within five years, throw me a number. Who else was it? Linda, where's your number? 
Yamil, uh, okay, no, 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 no. Yeah, Yamili, where's your number? Uh huh. Says the one uh, in the kitchen and trying uh, doing the the laundry while t trying to to do the real estate class. Got it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna believe that. Your husband doesn't count. Not not for this. Okay, sorry, doesn't count for this. <laughs> All right, so. Based on this, let's go to an average. Let's make it even. An average of 2,000. So we're going to raise the numbers. Average of 2,000 times six people. How much is that? 12,000, correct? Let me show you something. Unfortunately, I cannot increase these numbers. But if you guys see over there on the right, uh, it says, or I don't know, is that your right or your left? I don't know. Anyway, if you guys see the numbers there, what I did was put $250 on average per car. So let's say it's just one car here. Um, and at times 36 people, they're on the line. So this is $9,000 premium per month. $9,000 premium per month, okay? At the end of 60 months, which is five years, that's $540,000, okay? I probably you cannot see it because it's a little tiny over there, but. $540,000. That's the total premium paid to the insurance company. Guys, the insurance company only needs to keep 10% of that in their general account just in case there's an accident and also to pay for operating expenses. So they kept $54,000. How much was the claim for the six people? 12000 After paying all the claims, they still have $42,000 to pay for operating expenses, so employees and all that, okay? How many employees do you need for 36 people? Maybe one, if that much, or an owner operator will be, will be fine, so I don't need to pay uh, the employers, the, the employees, okay? So that means, guys, let's forget that money because it needs to stay in the, in, the, in the account. That means I collected $540,000. You guys are paying attention. I kept 54000 in, in the general account. How much money was left for me to invest as an insurance company? Half a million, almost. $486,000. That's just from 36 people. Did you guys get that? Okay. Why would they invest that money? Because in case we have somebody that goes over the threshold, over the forty, the fifty-four thousand dollars that's in reserve, over the ten percent that's in reserve, right? They want to make sure that it's secured, so they keep on investing the money. So all your premiums, ninety percent of that money, ninety percent of your premiums goes towards investments to secure, just in case they need larger payouts. But also that's how they become richer and richer and richer. Okay, so question. I always ask because I have a lot of fun with this. Who wants to open up an insurance company? You just contribute, right? You invest the majority of the money, right? Somebody else's money, not even yours. Think about it. Only six people out of 36, six people out of 36 actually had an accident in the past five years. What are the odds of accidents happening? People think, oh, but they happen every day. Yeah, but look at the millions of people and the amount of accidents and the amount of payouts in those accidents. Daphne, you'd rather be an investor? That's what this is. If you did not understand, I'm telling you, opening an insurance company, you will be the investor of other people's money, not even yours. There's no money from the insurance company or a bank. They always make money out of other people's money okay remember what I said in chapter 2 when we talked about escrow account escrow account was OPM other people's money and I told you it was my favorite drug OPM right other people's money because how can you make money it's not by using yours it's by leveraging other people's money right think about it as a, as a realtor as a realtor you're leveraging other people's property and you're making money out of their property right the house, real property, and the cash, personal property. 
and you're leveraging and you're taking a cut out of it. You're already an investor by being in this class. Think about it. Okay? Oh, Joe, I shouldn't have said that. Because that's what your realtor just did, right? I mean, my realtor, your realtor. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Let me get here. Hold on. Chat. There are some companies that have something called accident forgiveness. Some don't. Let's see what else. Gil, this is a problem. What do I mean you get killed every day in the market? As an investor? Where are you? Why don't I have you on my screen? Gil, 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 Gil. Oh, there you are. Okay. Oh, crypto. Didn't we just talk about Dogecoin and stuff like that? I know, I know, he says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, clean records at almost 50 years old. Never one accident? Impressive. Daphne is asking, what's the risk of what? Being an insurance company? Zero to none? And I'll tell you why not, because you also have something called reinsurance, just like the banks have it. There's reinsurance. That means they have an insurance company that will finance them or pay off an insurance claim if they don't have enough. So if I open an insurance company and I don't have enough money to pay the claims, I'll have another insurance company pay me to pay the claim. Simple. So I also pay premiums to another company for it. Um, even the natural disasters. So natural disasters is what I just told you. Uh, if insurance company has to pay out and it's more than what they have in reserves or what they, they should have for the claims, uh, then we go for reinsurance. So there's companies out there that will insure, like Lloyd's of London, for instance, they insure crazy stuff like uh, Tina Turner's uh, legs, right? Like uh, Jennifer Lopez's, uh, you know, that thing. Like... Um, um, a Rod's uh, arms and stuff like that. So, wrestlers. Yep. So these are called Lloyd's of London. They're, they're not an insurance company. They're um, they are um, a, a just so they're underwriting company. So they underwrite these crazy uh, insurances. Yep. Joseph says, "I work for State Farm, and I know." but you only get accident forgiveness after three years without an accident. Yeah, I mean, some people just said 50 years, 20 years, 30 years, so yeah. He's Jake. <laughs> I knew it was, <laughs> Jake was sounded fu uh, funny, right? It's Joe, not Jake. Jake is fake. All right, Peter, uh, are insurance companies insured? Yes. Do you need an insurance broker's license to start an insurance company? No, you just need to be an investor and find somebody that has a license and an actuary and, and a few other things, and you can start one for as low as $150,000. Moving on. <laughs> Watch, tomorrow there's going to be <laughs> new filings for insurance companies. <laughs> uh, Stephen, how's the whiskey? Good? He's going to say it's apple juice. Wait for it. Oh, tamarind. Okay, close. <laughs> um, next, right here. On top of investing your money, on top of investing your money, life insurance. Do you, if you guys know what life insurance is, is in case you die or depending on the type of policy, in case you become uh, permanently disabled, they will have to pay out something, right? Uh, so 
because people will die. It's a guaranteed thing, right? People will die. They know they have to pay out a claim. Now, luckily, if it's a term policy, as we said before, hopefully it will expire before they have to pay out. But if it's a permanent life insurance, it's long term, then they, they know that at one point, most likely, they will pay out, all right? So to ensure, like I said before, they invest the majority of the money, to ensure their investments, they go for more solid type of investments, usually taking part ownership or equity positions in projects that they finance. So why am I stopping here at this one? Because this is called participation financing, and this is the reason why you see big buildings, tall or large buildings, with insurance company names. It does not belong to the insurance company, right? But they finance the project with a condition of being part owners. So let's say I get 10% equity, let's say. So now I'm 10% owner just because I helped you finance. That was the exchange. So you got big buildings with my name on it, but I'm not the owner. Somebody else is. I'm part owner because of the financing, but that's it. Okay? And the funniest thing is that the tallest buildings, the largest buildings in any town are insurance or banks. You're going to see uh, Prudential. You're going to see AIG. You're going to see all these bigger names, PNC. You're going to see all these bigger names as the Bank of America building, the Prudential building, the Prudential Center, stuff like that, the Barclays one. And it might not even be theirs. They just gave financing to the developer in exchange for their name being on uh, that building. Okay? That's why, and I'm not getting into politics, I'm just giving you an example. That's why now you can go into certain buildings in New York, for instance, where they took down uh, Trump's name. Why? Because he was just a sponsor for a project at one time. That's how they got the financing from the bank. His name was attached to the development and they kept it for that purpose. All right? So that's why we can take down the names if needed for cert for uh, in, in certain scenarios. Okay? Again, not a political, so I'm not looking at, at uh, for comments. It was just to explain how a name sometimes gets there. It's not my building, my name got there. All right? <laughs> That's right. Make. Re I I know I know you didn't want to. <laughs> I forget your cell phone does, has a little problem with typing. Uh, I don't know if you call me a, a male real estate grid, grid again, baby, um, or if you're saying make real estate a grand. Uh, but anyway, all right, next. Mortgage bankers. Now here's, <laughs> I got you. Here's something I want to talk about. and. Uh, Again, I'm not going uh, too fast because the rest will be tomorrow. Mortgage bankers. Um, mortgage bankers, they lend their own money. There's a great advantage of using mortgage lenders, uh, bankers. So because they lend their own money, that means they make their own decisions. So if I'm a mortgage banker and you come to me and apply for a loan, right? I don't need a third party to make the decision. I'm making the decision. It's like for sale by owner, right? Do they need somebody else to, to help them make a decision? No, they're making the decision because they're the sellers. But if there's a realtor involved, mortgage broker, let's say, so there's a real estate broker, it's the same scenario, right? We're brokering the deal, so we're not the decision makers. You guys understand? Here, our institution is the decision maker. Here, we're brokering, so we're matching the mortgage company to the borrower Right? We match it and we take a fee out of it, just like real estate uh, brokers. You guys got it? Simple as that. So which one would be best? It depends on the scenarios, depends on the programs. Because if you go to Bank of America, they are mortgage bankers. Okay? You go to Chase, they're mortgage bankers. But not always they have the best product for you because they're limited to that. Now, smaller mortgage bankers, sometimes they... 
they have their own guidelines within government guidelines that will help the decision making to happen. See, banks, they intend to sell smaller lenders, might not. Okay, so they make a decision whether to sell or not. Mortgage brokers, they're us in the mortgage world. So we are, as I usually call it, realestatematch.com. They are mortgagematch.com. That's all. We match the seller to the buyer. They match the lender to the borrower. Simple as that. And I'm just waiting for Daphne to get to 95. You got it? Okay, she says never mind. I was going to say, by the end of this course, this is going to be a typewriting course as well. By the end of this course, there's going to be 95 words per minute. <laughs> All right, so let me see where she's at. Uh, Daphne, did you get it? I answered your question? Okay. <laughs> awesome. The coolest thing is that some people roll their eyes and the other one's like, yeah, that was my question. All right, so they just wait. I see, Daphne, I see some of them, they wait and they look at the screen, see if you're typing, right? Because then they don't have to type. They have to, see, Joseph is agreeing. That's it. Gil is like, yeah, because my typing sucks. Let her do it. <laughs> credit unions. Do you guys know what a credit union is? It's a cooperative organization. So that means it's a mutual uh, um, union. The mute, union is mutual. So it means that we own it. We, the um, account holders, are also the members of the credit union. So we own the bank, let's say. Okay? So why, every time, every time you see cooperative organizations, it's mutual. So credit unions... The members own okay now why would you go to a credit union versus anywhere else because credit unions they're for the people of the credit union so they have uh, looser guidelines they can probably get you financed faster or easier than anywhere else they might have a little bit higher interest rates but at least it's almost guaranteed that you get that loan so why am I saying this because like I said before, sometimes Bank of America says no to you, right, to your clients. Then tell your client, hey, let's try somewhere else. Don't give up. Let's try somewhere else. Let's go to a credit union. Let's look for a mortgage banker. Let's go for a mortgage broker. Let's go to different options, guys. Just because the one bank said no doesn't mean they're not qualified. You guys got it? There's a lot of realtors that make this mistake. Oh, sorry. You cannot buy a house, come back to me later. No. Oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Would you mind if we go look with, with, with somebody else? Maybe you can get approved. We'll look at your current credit report that just got pulled. And if they say yes, we'll move forward. If they say no, no harm, no foul. Does that make sense? All right. You guys leave so much money on the table. It's ridiculous. The amount of money that realtors leave on the table by not um, taking care of their clients properly. Chad, yep, absolutely, absolutely. All right, guys, so this is like the most underestimated uh, form of financing. If you guys want to know, you get denied for for car, since Chad mentioned car, you get denied for a car, there are credit unions that specialize in car loans. There are credit unions that specialize in business loans. There are credit unions that specialize in mortgages, as it says right here. Guys, just don't give up right away. Don't let your clients give up. The dream is there and we can make it a, a reality. All right, next thing, application for credit. I think everybody knows. I'm, I'm sure there's nobody here that has never applied for credit, right? Everybody has. Oh, wait, hold on. Perla is holding on to one that has not applied for credit. <laughs> all right, but everybody else, I think you've all applied for a credit, even the credit card, if anything. So you know that they ask for everything, right? Look at all these highlights. They ask you for your name, your address, right? They ask for Perla's firstborn. They ask for the cat. They ask for the dog, the neighbor's uh, information as well, and your blood type just in case. They ask for a lot of info. Why? For the purpose of underwriting. What is underwriting? Risk assessment. 
underwriting <clears throat> is risk assessment. I need to know if you're a high risk of default, medium risk of default, or low risk of default. Should I lend to you? That's pretty much what they're analyzing. Should I lend to you? Give me as much info as you can so I can determine if you're a solid buyer or borrower in this case, and you'll be able to pay back the loan. What are the odds of you defaulting? That's what underwriting is. Uh, Daphne, a uh, mortgage banker is the lender. They use their own funds. So Bank of America is a mortgage banker. Okay? Wells Fargo is a mortgage banker, a.k.a. lenders. They can lend their own money. All right. <clears throat> so let's say they studied the credit report. They studied your taxes. They studied all your information. They're going to issue a loan commitment. That loan commitment we call pre-approval. A pre-qualification, guys, so you know is different from a pre-approval. Pre-approval is a commitment. Pre-qualification is like, yeah, I guess you could qualify to buy a house, maybe. I don't know. Based on what you told me, not based on what I saw. Yeah, $400,000 house, sure. Do you guys understand? A pre-qualification, guys, is simply you ask a few questions, they give you a few answers, done. Pre-approval Pre-approval is we analyze every single document, including your credit report, right? We've verified your employment. We've verified everything that you've, you've been talking about. And now we're saying, yeah, it's a solid written commitment. We will hold a mortgage up to a given amount, okay? So pre-approval is what you guys want. Don't show me any buyer that has a pre-qualification because it's worthless. Show me buyers are pre-approved which could still be worthless. Look here. Unless the borrowers, pay attention to this, unless the borrower's financial situation changes before closing, this is something so important. Look right here. Unless the borrower's situation closes, uh, uh, changes, I'm sorry, before closing, the bank is committed to give you a loan. If nothing changes, you are getting this loan. It's a commitment. It's a pre-approval. You are approved. That's what it is, okay? The problem is, three months later, as we're getting to the closing table, lenders re-verify credit and employment, something that catches borrowers by surprise. What does that mean? It means... Do not change your jobs, okay? Oh, but I'm getting paid more over there. Great, can you hold on another week so we can close and then you move? Because if not, we're gonna have to wait another month or two to get pay stubs that prove that you are really staying at this job, all right? How about buying a car? I got approved for a $400,000 house, yep. I got approved for a $400,000 house. What's a $40,000 car? Right? It's only 10% of it. How much could it affect? Well, $40,000 car is $600 a month. $600 a month is $100,000 less on that mortgage approval. So you got to approve for uh, $400,000. Great car, by the way. You cannot buy this house of three fifty dollars because you just dropped um, in uh, purchasing power because of that car. So you guys want to buy a car? You guys want to... Uh, change jobs you guys want to buy more stuff with your credit cards yes after we close the the day after you close you can do whatever you want until we close i want all your credit cards i'm going to shred them all okay your your hand that you used to write left or right i don't care which one it is i'm going to have to break it so you don't sign anything for the next three months you should heal in three months so we can close in time right as a matter of fact do not breathe, Mr. Buyer or Mrs. Buyer. Do not breathe because you got approved based on your current situation. If you change the current situation, we might not be able to close. And guys, believe it, this is going to happen. Uh, this is going to happen a lot of times where people start buying the, the furniture for the house they don't have. True story. A student of mine told me in San Francisco where she was living, her and her husband, 
they bought furniture, $20,000 worth of furniture for a house that they were about to close, and all of a sudden, their job relocated them to Arizona. So what do you think happened to the furniture? It was going to cost more to take it to Arizona, right, than to sell it quickly for way less, right? So this is just to show. I had a friend of mine that he bought a short sale. Short sale is, is very difficult to close on, and until it's closed, it's not closed, just like every other sale, but short sales are even worse. So this guy started buying stuff at Home Depot and started fixing stuff at the house that was not his yet. And he almost did not close. Imagine, he put almost $10,000 into that property, not closed yet, and almost did not close. We almost lost that deal. Are you guys understanding this? Do not buy stuff until closing. Do not apply for any new credit like Gil just said. Do not close credit cards. A lot of people make this mistake. Close credit cards. Why? Because all this affects your FICO score. What is the FICO score? It's what the banks use to determine your um, eligibility or your um, borrowability, like being able to borrow money and not default. If you have a high score, you know what? You're getting a loan. If you have a mid score, let's consider what type of loan this is. If you have a low score, it's going to be tough. We can still do it, but it's going to be tough. You guys understand? FICO score. You might not get a, a, a job um, a promotion. You might not get a job at all because of your, your credit score. Your insurance might cost you more right now because of your credit score. There's so many things attached to this, okay? FICO score. All right, and the last thing before we close the day, this will be tomorrow. It's going to go into secondary market. Okay. The last thing is, oh, by the way, if you have less than 620 scores, we need to talk because you're considered a subprime risk. Subprime means you're high risk. That means your loan is going to cost you more as well. You guys got it? So you need to improve your credit. That's one of the things you need to do. Now I can either give you a few tips or I can recommend a few companies that you could work with. Totally up to you. If you have bad credit or if your buyers have bad credit, you can always ask for that information. Let's go to qualifying ratios. This is literally the last thing we're gonna talk about today. Qualifying ratios. So there's something called front end ratio and there's something called back end ratio, all right? Now, what is a ratio? It's called debt to income how much debt you have compared to your income, okay? So qualified ratios are based on DTI, debt to income. They want to make sure if you have low debt toward, against your income, right, you are most likely approved. If you have too much debt compared to your income, you are most likely not approved, okay? So this scenario right here, guys, the 2836, this scenario, is a safe scenario for the lender. It's not good for you, it's not bad for you. If you can qualify here, perfect. But it's very difficult. You gotta have stellar credit, you have gotta have great income. It's difficult, right? So the banks sometimes extend, and I'll explain this in a second, sometimes extend higher ratios. This way it allows more people to buy, okay? So I'll explain that right now. There's front end ratio, which is 28 right here. This is for housing expense. Housing expense, which is PITI, Principal Interest Tax and Insurance. And then there's a back end ratio, which is right here for income, including other long term debts. So not only your PITI, but also long term debts. Okay? Ready? I'm gonna explain right now, uh, I'll come back to the screen. But let me explain here. Because I already have it, so it's gonna be a lot easier. So like I said, right here, there is the front end ratio, which is 
housing expense, right? And there's the back end ratio, which is housing plus all other debts. So let's translate this. 2836 is 28% front end, 36% back end. So if you make $10,000 gross monthly income, GMI gross monthly income, $10,000 per month, gross, not what you take home, is what you wish you took home, okay? So that's a gross, right? Then the max, based on these numbers, the max that you can afford for housing, that means your mortgage, including taxes and insurance, cannot be more than 2800 right? 28% of your gross income, 2800 That also means that your house, your car, and any other loans you might have, other financing debts that you might have, cannot exceed 3600 a month. That's the back-end ratio. You guys understand? So your house expense, mortgage, which is principal, interest, taxes, insurance, no more than 2800 a month if you have $10,000 gross monthly income. And no more than 36 for house, so 2800 plus the car, plus um, credit cards. If it exceeds this, and this lender that says, hey, 2836 only, if it exceeds any of these numbers, the lender says rejected. Nope, not gonna happen unless they pay down their debt down to 28% of X or 36% of X. You guys got it? So that's the way the banks look at it. If you make 5000 if you make 5000 a month, so it's easy. It's the same scenario. 28% of that is 1400 a month. Your mortgage cannot be more, including taxes and insurance, cannot be more than 1400 a month. If you make 5000 your mortgage, car, and other debts cannot be more than 1800 a month. You guys with me so far? Great. Let's say the banks right now are doing this, which is the standard right now. It's something ar around here. Some are even pushing further than this, uh, 55, 60s, which is ridiculous. Let's say this is what they're doing. That means for the same $10,000 a month, how much can your mortgage be? Well, 43% of that is 4300 for a mortgage. Principal, interest, tax, insurance. Okay? For the mortgage and car and other debts, the max that you can afford is 5500 So anytime it exceeds these numbers, the bank will say, no, we're not approving you. All right? So there's a potential question in the state exam. I put it here to give you an idea. The question says something to the effect of the Stanleys uh, make $37,000 gross yearly income. I put here Y for yearly because we talked about monthly, right? So here's yearly. If the bank expects a 28-36 ratio, but they have no other debts, what is the max that they could afford? So this is a, a question that could be presented. What is the max that they can afford? Well, um, let's take the, the rent so you guys don't see that. Okay. The first thing you have to do is figure out how much the rent, the income is monthly. Because calculations I just showed you here is always based on monthly, right? So here was the question. 37,000 gross yearly income, 2836, no other debts. So that means if there's no debts, we don't need, sorry, right here, we don't need the 36%. The only number we need is 28. Because 36 would be if you have more debts. If they said $500 on a car loan, then it will go into this. Okay, so the first number is the only thing we need. We're going to divide the, the salary by 12, and we know they make 3083 a month. Okay, that's now their gross monthly income. And your calculations for mortgage are based on monthly. Because they approve 28% of your gross monthly income, then your mortgage could not be more than $863 a month. If you make $3,000 a month, your mortgage cannot be more than 
a month in this scenario, okay? If the ratio was higher, then you could afford more. But in this scenario, that's the max that you can afford. So the answer would have been that in the question, okay? And then I just addressed real quickly, if it's a multifamily, so this is why it's easy for us to understand and explain to, to buyers uh, why multifamily is better. So right here, if you add rent to your income, you just added 75% of this to your income. So now you can afford more house. Your affordability goes up because you make more monthly. The rental income of the house you still don't have counts towards your income for the purchase of that house. Okay? All right, guys. Any questions before we end for tonight? Did I explain it properly? Were you guys clear on it? All right. All clear? <laughs> Anybody turn on already the thing? All clear? <laughs> uh, can I send you this chart? What chart? No. I'm not sending you anything. No. Watch the video. I actually have a video just on this. Go watch that video because I'll explain. I didn't get the stuff on top. All right. Uh, what I would do instead of sending sending you this, I'll actually tell you, go to the YouTube channel. And this is, I'm not uh, trying to pull your leg or anything uh, or trying to brush you off. Is literally I created a video on this. Okay. So go watch that video. It's dedicated to this so you don't have to scroll through the whole chapter. Uh, just like adjustable rate mortgages, I created one just for the adjustable rate mortgages. I created one just for points. And as you guys ask for uh, these things, like as you ask questions, I create the videos for it. So I have one just for this. The reason, so Daphne, the reason I don't want to send you just this, okay, is because you probably won't be clear by just having a print of this. Okay, so the explanation is what what will help you. All right. So it doesn't to me it doesn't make sense. I can send it to this to you, or you can take a screenshot. Totally up to you. But um, I would definitely um, go over the, the YouTube uh, channel, search. Once you get to my YouTube ch channel, just search um, qualifying ratios and the, the video will pop up, okay? Tidy goes like, could you send the link in WhatsApp? Fine. So demanding you people, unbelievable. Searching is going to, you guys are always Googling stuff, but you cannot go on YouTube and, and put in qualifying ratios, new direction school. And then you go out there and eat ice creams and other stuff right in my face as I'm teaching. And then you want me to still send you a link. That's fine. I see how it is. All right, guys, any other questions? Let me know if you have questions. If you don't have questions, I bid you good night. If you have questions, I'll stay here a little bit longer and I'll answer all those questions, okay? I'll see you tomorrow at 5.30 for those of you that are partying. <laughs> partying, like leaving, not partying, okay? <laughs> good night, guys. <laughs> Chad, going partying. <laughs> All right, a few of you are still here. Boom, boom. You're you're just like waiting for the end, huh? Vanessa, are you going to ooh, hold on? Right here. Okay, are you going to upload chapters 13 and 14? Um in the student portal, I already uploaded part uh, the one I, I did, part one and two of um, chapter 13. Student portal should also have part one and two of chapter 14. Give it a try. If you have any questions there, then um, I'll address it. Um, as far as this right here, we have chapter 21 for that. We're going to talk about the closing tables, 
uh, deeds, contracts, is all coming up. So we're going to talk about that. You <laughs> gotcha. All right. Uh, Daphne, what's the difference between mortgage brokers and regular brokers? What do you mean? What's a regular broker? A broker is just somebody that exchanges um, or markets somebody else's uh, business. A broker is uh, just a mediator. Perla, really? Where's Perla? Really? You're on YouTube? You're on the New Direction School? Video's name, qualifying ratios. No? Can't find it? Fine. I'm telling you. I'm looking for it, I'm just waiting for um, more questions to come through, okay? I see what it is. Okay. You are right. I am sorry. See, I admit my mistakes. Haha, -ha, really? <laughs> All right. You know what it is? Because I had merged. This is from my previous channel. And I merged it to New Direction School, and I lost a few stuff when I merged, a few videos. So I did upload them, but I didn't enable a few yet. So I'll take care of that, and I will share on WhatsApp and all that, okay? Fine. So the many, I'm telling you. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Wrap around is there. Discount points is there. Adjustable rate is there. Good. You know that. Great. Good night, Meredith. Um, Vanessa can get it either. The name of the video can find. Got it. All right. I got it. You can find it. All right. Everybody already said that. Uh, Daphne, what's a mortgage broker? Uh, so, sorry. So, a um, Daphne, a mortgage broker is just for financing. We don't deal with financing, right? So, if you want to buy a house, sorry. So, if you want to buy a house, we're not the ones that are going to help you finance the the purchase because we don't represent the lender. A mortgage broker represents the lender, okay? A mortgage banker is the lender. So a mortgage broker is like us. We're going to go see a lot of houses for the buyer. We're going to go to different sellers. A mortgage broker is going to see different banks to approve your buyer, okay? So why would you use a mortgage broker? Like Ricardo that was here um, on Friday, Ricardo, his company is a mortgage banker. That means his company lends money directly, right? They don't go shop around. They lend directly. They're mortgage bankers, right? But if he was a mortgage broker, then his company shops around dip, like mortgage, like a LendingTree.com, Bankrate, Quicken Loans. They shop different uh, banks to give you the loan, right? We, we don't want that because there's a commission on top of a commission on top of a commission. Everybody got to get paid. So usually those will come either with higher origination fees or higher interest rates compared to a mortgage banker that will lend their own money. You got it? So that's the reason why we, we use 
a mortgage broker. A real estate broker or a real estate salesperson, they handle the sale of real estate, not the financing part, okay? Uh, Ty, you asking if you qualify for the test, really? You just want to do the test, right? All right, I'll let you do the test on Saturday. 10 a.m. And I want a 99% score. Bye, Vanessa. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Good night, Catherine. Nope. If there's no questions, guys, good night. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll see you tomorrow at 5.30, okay? Bye.